Good afternoon, everyone. We now resume our council session today with a important proclamation recognizing Breast Cancer Awareness Month by Councilmember Nevada. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today we are here to commemorate uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, which we know we do that every October. And um, unfortunately, we didn't, this would be the memo my colleagues usually wear, they're really cool uh, pink ties, but we, we kind of, I'm, I'm here representing for everybody, uh, but they will do that next year for sure. Um, and so I, I want to welcome Claire Duggerty. She's the CEO of the Brand Foundation. And um, after we read the proclamation, she'll make some remarks. Uh, traditionally here on the county council every year, we do, um, we do our best to spotlight organizations that are doing amazing work in the space of uh, breast cancer awareness is also, and also support. And it is something, a tradition that we uh, here take very, very seriously because we know the devastation uh, the breast uh, cancer, um, the impact, the devastating impact that it has um, in our communities. And it is important to uh, note that one in eight women will develop breast cancer at some point in their life. Um, and then when you think, of course, of that statistic, you realize the impact that it has on all of us. Um, I oftentimes have, you know, shared that my younger sister, Aldred Elizabeth Navarro, died of metastat metastatic um, breast cancer in 2010 and she was 39 years old uh, and she had an opportunity actually to receive some treatment here um, in uh, Montgomery County and there were organizations that were extraordinary and I, I had a front row seat um, in terms of uh, the extraordinary support that they provided to her and to so many many women uh, and it makes an absolute difference um, you know, we never think that we have to be uh, confronted ever with a situation where you're literally sitting across the table um, from your, you know, 39-year-old sister talking about um, things like, you know, the, the best possible wig that you can have or, uh, you know, radiation treatment. And, and it's something that it is so critical to have organizations present who provide that kind of support and help you know, family members also be there uh, for their loved ones. And so it is something that is very uh, near and dear to my heart and to many, many of us uh, also here on the county council. And so what I'm going to do um, is talk a little bit about the Brand Foundation, which actually has been around since 2006 and has dedicated itself to maximizing every woman's chance of survival through education, access, and early detection, which is so important, as we all know. They not only educate women on the importance of screening, but also ensure they have access to diagnostic tests and even will give someone a ride to their appointment if it is needed. Through advocacy, they have worked tirelessly uh, to ensure everyone affected has a fighting chance regardless of their financial means. And you will hear a little bit more about their work. Um, so I'm going to read the proclamation um, and then I'll, um, I'll ask Claire to make some remarks, and of course, if any of my colleagues want to make remarks as well, they are also welcome. Whereas October is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and since the campaign began in 1985, there has been a gradual reduction in female breast cancer in women age 50 and older, and death rates have declined since 1990 due to better screening, early detection, increased awareness, and continually improving treatment options. And whereas in the United States, more than 287,850 women and approximately 2,710 men are diagnosed with breast cancer annually. One in eight or 13% of women will develop breast cancer at some point in her life, making breast cancer the most common cancer among women except for skin cancer. And whereas since 2006, the Brand Foundation has reached over 2 million people with education on early detection of breast cancer, covered the cost of over 2,000 tests, 
has given over 1,200 rides to screening and diagnostic appointments and helped to draft and pass dense breast legislation at the local level. And whereas the Brent Foundation continues to actively serve thousands in Montgomery County and dedicate themselves to maximizing every woman's chance of detecting breast cancer early, regardless of her ability to pay through education, access, and advocacy. And whereas the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the disparities in access to needed medical treatment faced by communities of color nationwide, as well as risks that comorbidity with breast cancer poses to individuals. And whereas this month, we stand with the mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, and friends who have been affected by breast cancer. And we recognize the ongoing efforts of dedicated advocates, researchers, and healthcare providers, and contributions of organizations like the Brem Foundation, helping to prevent, detect, and treat cancer, and working towards a future free from cancer in all forms. Now, therefore, be it resolved that county, the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes October 2020. 2022 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And this is signed by our council president, Gabe Albornoz, and myself, Nancy Navarro. And um, before I turn it over to, to Claire, I just want to say it's so important to make sure you schedule your mammogram. Uh, I did that and then had a call back and uh, that was fine. But it is so important to do that and to be very methodical and making sure that you're constantly on top of your own health. So. With that, Claire, we'd love to hear from you and then from any of my colleagues that would like to make some remarks. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Sir. Okay, Thanks. wonderful. Thank you. Well, what an honor to be here with all of you today. Um, and I have to say, Council Member Navarro, it really breaks my heart to hear about your sister, and I really appreciate you sharing the story. And I think the Brem Foundation was created to make sure that there are 39, no more 39-year-old women die from breast cancer ever again. Our focus is early detection. Detect early, save lives is our mantra. Um, we focus on doing so, as I mentioned, or as was mentioned, through education, through access programs, and advocacy. Um, we are thrilled and really honored to work in Montgomery County, primarily through Adventist Health. They are one of our prime partners. And we work to provide grants to them to cover the costs of diagnostic services for women who often can't afford them, um, as the out-of-pocket costs can be really high for ultrasounds and MRIs. And we have a unique and innovative partnership with Lyft, the ride-sharing service, removing transportation as an access barrier. Um, but really, I think this month is about is about the women. It's about the women who have passed. It's about the women who have survived. And it's about the women like Councilwoman Navarro and so many others, and of course her, uh, her colleagues, who stand up and say, no more. We're not going to have women die from breast cancer when there are so many tools at our disposal to, to diagnose and detect early. Um, my last thing will be, um, I think it was, it was very important earlier this month when Katie Couric came forward with her diagnosis, because I think she really reminded us all, we have to get screened, we have to stay on top of our screening. Even six months late can make things harder for you if you are diagnosed with breast cancer. So women, please advocate for yourself, make sure that you understand your risk factors, your family history, your breast density situation, and make sure that you are using all the tools in your toolbox to remain healthy. Um, but this sort of proclamation really means a lot, and we look forward to partnering with the Montgomery County Council to save more women's lives across the county. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman Navarro, for bringing us together. As fate would have it, we're having a special session on Thursday where my colleagues and I will be together, and I promise I will be wearing a pink tie. Uh, during that special session, I, and I suspect my colleagues will as well. So this has touched so many families, including mine. Uh, as we speak, my aunt, Lisa Max, is battling breast cancer right now. And she is among my mom's best friends. And seeing it how is, is it not just impacted Lisa, but her entire family and our entire extended family uh, has been so challenging but seeing how she has fought so valiantly has also been so inspiring. And so I so appreciate the work of this remarkable foundation to make sure, as noted, 
that we don't have to experience that that more families don't have to experience this moving forward so this is an important month for us to recognize awareness to recognize the preventative measures that that our loved ones must take and really eliminate the stigma uh, associated with with this terrible cancer so thank you so much councilman navarro for your continued leadership on this and so many other issues Well, I want to say thank you to Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Navarro knows all too well about, she's heard the stories about my aunt Gloria, who passed away from breast cancer, and now my cousin Tiffany, who basically grew up as my sister, is now in the battle of her life. Um, this is something, unfortunately, that affects both sides of my family, uh, both on my wife's side uh, and on my side, uh, to where there's a history of breast cancer uh, in our family. And so as Tiffany, uh, and I want to give her a shout out for being such a trooper, um, is, you know, fighting continuously and just finished her rounds of uh, chemotherapy. And so we're very hopeful um, for uh, success in terms of having a positive outcome. Um, but this is one where, and I thank Councilmember Navarro for also highlighting the men, because my Uncle Benny um, actually uh, is finally uh, on a great pathway to recovery after having some continual issues regarding his breast cancer. Uh, and so I want to highlight, as we're approaching Men's Health Month in November, uh, to remind men that you are not immune from breast cancer as well. And so please continue to get checked as well. Be mindful of your body. Make sure that you're doing those kinds of inspections and tests because this is not just women. While it predominantly affects women, um, there is no question that there are men who get diagnosed uh, every single year. And so from that standpoint, we need to highlight that more for uh, our, our men, especially our men of color, who oftentimes typically don't get checked out as much uh, as their counterparts. And so from that standpoint, I'm really appreciative of the Graham Foundation for all the work that you continue to do because as my cousin, <laughs> as my cousin Tiffany said, um, things are different now between when Aunt Gloria had breast cancer and when I have it. And I know that I can beat this. And so that's what we want for everyone. Um, we want to make sure that everyone can beat this and collectively working with great foundations, working with great leaders like Councilmember Navarro and all of my colleagues and all of you in this room, we can make that happen. So thank you guys. Thank you very much to Councilmember Navarro and, and to the foundation and everyone associated with this. Unfortunately, there's no family that I have ever met over the last several years, it has not been affected by, by breast cancer, with, certainly in my own family, in my wife's family. And, and it's so uh, difficult because you don't know what to do and you, and you feel so, in many cases, helpless. But I also want to take a moment to thank those people who have gotten into the profession of helping other people. And, and I have have friends who, who uh, were oncologists who, who absolutely save lives, save lives every day. And many times we almost take that for granted. We almost think that this is a death sentence, and it is not because of the research, much of which is done right here in Montgomery County, that, that people have taken their, their lives, made their lives to save other people's lives. So with that, I thank you for all that you do but we certainly thank those who, many of whom are not in the room today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I, I will just echo um, um, my gratitude to the foundation and to Council Member Navarro for continuing to honor her sister by raising awareness of this horrible scourge um, that, that claims so many lives each year. Um, Sydney's right, it, it's affected all of us. Um, all of us have friends or family members, in my case, former legislative aide as well, um, greatly affected by breast cancer. Um, and, and I'm sorry to hear the, the stories of my, my colleagues, and I'm grateful for you to mention your mentioning of, of the impact on men as well. Um, we're, we're in many ways, as bad as uh, this disease is, very lucky in Montgomery County that we have such great providers. We have great clinics, community-based clinics. We have great nonprofit partners. Um, and we have a lot of availability of um, treatment, of providers, and testing. But none of that matters 
if people don't take advantage of them, which is why events like this and our continued dialogue around this are so important, um, Councilmember Navarro. So thank you for everything you're doing. Um, thank you for everything that's happening at the, at the foundation. And we want to know any ways that we can continue to be supportive to, to help you in your life-saving work. Thank you. All right. Okay, we're going to take a photo. Yes? All right. We'll take a quick recess and recommence with our public hearings at 1.30. Thank you.
All right, can we get a countdown? We are live in five, four, three, two, one. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We resume our council session today with item number eight, which is a public hearing. This is a public hearing on supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 capital budget and an amendment to the FY23 through 28 capital improvements program CIP in the amount of $750,000 for Montgomery County Public Schools technology modernization. A public, this is the public hearing. Uh, persons wishing to submit additional material for the, say I don't read verbatim. I, I, persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration uh, should do so by the end of this week. Uh, we do have three speakers for this public hearing, and I would like to uh, invite, um, or I, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Theodora Scarato will be testifying virtually, and you have two minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Monies towards school technology should ensure children's safety. Wi-Fi laptops, tablets, and routers and access points, they are not safe for kids. A recent landmark paper published in the journal Environmental Health finds wireless associated with a range of adverse health effects, including cardiomyopathy, carcinogenicity, excuse me, DNA damage, neurological effects, um, increased permeability of the blood-brain barrier, and sperm damage. Yet wireless industry-funded scientists say not to worry. Wireless is everywhere, and everyone's doing it. Asbestos, DDT, and Agent Orange were also legal. The, um, you know, what about pregnant teachers and pregnant students? Yale research has found damaged memory from wireless exposure during pregnancy. Just because it's non-ionizing does not mean it's safe. Kaiser Permanente studies link non-ionizing electromagnetic fields during pregnancy to miscarriage, and that's a replicated study, higher asthma and obesity. Several countries have banned Wi-Fi from nursery schools and restricted it in order to protect children from radiofrequency radiation. The Maryland State Commission on Children and Environmental Health Protection recommends reducing Wi-Fi exposure in schools. My fierce grandparents taught me to always do the right thing, to be on the right side of history, and I am thankful to them. There is no safe level of lead because there is no level of harm to a child's brain that is acceptable. Yet for years, the, wire, the uh, lead industry was successful in getting officials to green light lead into gasoline and paint, and that's a toxic legacy that continues to this day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person who will be testifying is Laura Simon. You have two minutes. You may begin your testimony now. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I just press this arrow, I guess, that's how it works. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you for having me here today. I'm, um, I'm opposed to this because I, it seems crazy to um, the amount of money that we put in for technology. Just today in the post, the uh, state superintendent said that since 2013, 
that the technology, uh, that the scores of kids have been going down. And that coincides with when we started um, um, rolling out all the technology. So it has not fared very well for our kids. And I think if you want to work for um, teacher retention, then um, we need to do whatever it takes to get the best teachers in the places that need it most. And, and that's not going to happen by letting them choose their own technology. It's just more waste in technology money. And I asked my daughter this morning, I said, what classes did you like best in school? And she said, eighth grade math. She's a junior now, which normally brings her to tears sometimes math. And she said it was because of the teacher. So math of all her subjects, her least favorite, and then world history. And again, because of the teacher, we need to treat our teachers like the precious commodities they are. And again, do whatever it takes to get the best teachers in the places that need it most. And re with respect to the technology, put some of this money, I mean, this, this bill is so big. Why are we not hiring a health star? The county council themselves sued the FCC with respect to health issues because they themselves were concerned about the health issues. Well, we've blanketed the schools in radiation. The, the person who just testified mentioned um, so much so much of these issues, so I, I won't go into it in the 20 seconds I have, but we need a health star. We've got uh, over 160,000 precious students and souls, and you need to take care of them. You need to add health into this technology so that we can merge the technology with the health aspects and keep the children as safe as possible. This hasn't happened in almost a decade. You need to do what's right for the kids, and and you need to do it now. Thank you. Thank you for that testimony. Next, we will hear from Catherine Cateson, who I believe is here in person. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, if the council approves this um, budget amendment to the CIP, I would ask, as the other speakers have done, or actually as Theodore has done, that none of this money be spent on wireless technologies. Our children, teachers, and staff deserve safe and healthy technology. Wi-Fi networks and cell phones create high-density wireless radio frequency exposures in classrooms. In last year's court case, Environmental Health Trust v. FCC, the court ordered the FCC to review the totality of the evidence, which has not been done by any expert agency in the U.S. government, including one, the impacts of RF radiation on children, two, the ubiquity of wireless devices, and three, the impacts of RF radiation on the environment. In this court case, 11,000 pages of evidence documented adverse effects on children and the environment. Research has found radio frequency radiation associated with cancer, brain damage, headaches, memory and attention problems, and damage to the reproductive system. Safer solutions do exist that allow interconnectivity, internet connectivity without harmful wireless exposures. Many schools in the U.S. and world, worldwide are replacing wireless with safe wired technology connections due to this research. Teacher unions are passing resolutions for safe technology. Oregon has passed a bill to study the health effects of Wi-Fi in schools, and the Maryland State Children's Environmental Health and Protection Council issued the first ever U.S. state recommendations to reduce classroom wireless exposure. The council urgently needs to develop a comprehensive strategy for protecting children and all residents from radio frequency harms, just like you have done with monitoring of radon and lead exposure in homes and schools. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes our speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Action is tentatively scheduled for this item on November 1st. That moves us to the next item on the agenda, and this is a public hearing on Special Appropriation 23-27 to the County Government's FY23 operating budget for the Department of Health and Human Services Food Staples Program in the amount of $8,150,000. Action is scheduled immediately following this hearing. There are no speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Um, I will tee this up. Um, and then turn it over to uh, Ms. Clemens Johnson and Ms. McGuire to uh, back clean up um, to make sure I've covered all the bases here. And then Council Vice President Glass um, as a follow-up item that was discussed in committee that we did not vote on 
uh, to give us a little bit more opportunity to find out more information about, which uh, he will go into greater detail describing. But basically, uh, we want to thank the executive branch, the Department of Health and Human Services, but most importantly, uh, the staff and the nonprofit providers that are doing outstanding work in the area of food security. Uh, it is remarkable, uh, the infrastructure that we have been able to establish since the beginning of the pandemic to more effectively reach our residents that have been in crisis and the most in need throughout the pandemic. And coming out of that, among the silver linings of the pandemic were the development of the hubs, and which provide a time and place for uh, the county government, working with the community and our residents and the private sector, which has helped in many ways as well, um, providing volunteers and making sure we expand our reach. So uh, this uh, supplemental appropriation is to continue that work and recognize that the need has not only not gone away, uh, but that it has increased in some ways uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And with the Office of Food Resilience, with the infrastructure we've been able to build, with the new organizations that have entered into this space, I have supreme confidence that we are going to continue the momentum that we have been able to build. So with that, I will turn it over to you to uh, tee this up from a broad perspective, and then I'll turn to Vice President Glass to describe the item we didn't vote on in committee. Thank you, Council President. Um, so as you detailed, the HHS committee met on October 20th and recommended approval of the special appropriation for 8.1 $5 million. Um, during that committee session, Council Member Glass introduced a funding request for So What Else Incorporated. They are another organization in the community supporting food recovery and emergency hunger relief. So um, the committee requested that staff provide additional information and we also requested that our um, colleagues in the executive office in DHHS come and share um, more about this funding request and details about what this looks like for um, FY23 if the council will choose to um, take action on it. So I would invite our guests to come to the table. And I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Glass. Thank you very much. So we had a really good conversation in committee about the important work that is being undertaken by our nonprofit partners to make sure that uh, our residents are healthy and fed and sustained. And the uh, one point $8.15 million appropriation uh, is an impressive list of organizations in our community, um, notably in recognition of the work that they have been doing. Uh, but we know that that list is not exhaustive, and there are other organizations that are doing this work. And the, the dialogue I engaged in and the question I asked was particularly about organizations that had either applied or engaged with the county, but uh, for a reason or two did not end up on this list. And, and to put a finer point on it, the organization that, that was referenced, So What Else, which is a nonprofit that does some food recovery and, and youth engagement in the Rockville Gaithersburg area, um, was under the belief that they were to be getting funding and uh, made their own expenditures toward this goal, uh, but in the end are not on this list. And that was the question I asked why they weren't on this list because the work had essentially been done. And the motion I made at committee, which was deferred to this conversation, which I will re-up right now, is I'd like to make a motion to add $130,000 to this list so that so what else gets essentially refunded for the work that they had been doing over the last number of months. All right, we have a motion and a second to add the 130000 to the uh, 8.1 and change. Um, I see Councilmember Rice would like to speak. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And so I had asked uh, for additional information at committee and had asked that we um, defer this decision uh, as I was not prepared, uh, not having all of the information. The reality is, is we have great organizations throughout Montgomery County who do incredible work. Uh, not just in food uh, uh, acquisition, and that's fresh food that goes to residents, but also in food recovery. There are many who are working in this space. And so one of the things that we as this council have continued to do is try and stay out of picking winners and losers. Um, and I fear uh, that by doing this, we are setting ourselves up for a problem because I know that there are organizations who would love to have additional funding 
if they reach out to the council and ask for it. Uh, we've tried to step back from that. And while I understand that there were certain situations, now that I've gotten more information uh, about uh, a misunderstanding or um, lack of follow through on a promise that was made, the reality is, is that still does not uh, change the fact that we have a longstanding policy of how we do not uh, single out organizations for funding. Um, we used to do that and ran into tremendous challenges here on this council with that. Uh, and so I will not support this and I advise my colleagues not to because you'll be going down a rabbit hole where I promise you, you'll have other organizations that once they see this and are aware of it, will ask for additional funding if they were not recipients of additional funding as well. And so that would be my suggestion for the council. So thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Jawando, followed by Councilmember Friedson and then Councilmember Navarro. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Um, Council staff mentioned some people that were supposed to come down to explain something about, who were you talking about? I didn't benefit from the HHS discussion, so. Our guests are being shy. So we have Jason <laughs> from um, DHHS. Okay. And we also have Earl Stoddard from Great. the County Executive Office. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, the shy Earl Stoddard. Um, and I think it just, it'll help with my question, you know, to the point that was just made Obviously, I just I visited so what else? They're great. They're awesome. They have great young people working there. They're doing incredible work. Uh, I was there just a few weeks ago, uh, but I I would I'd like to know a little bit more about what happened and why. Uh, what was the disagreement and in, in from the executive's perspective? Yeah. So the generally speaking, uh, I think we this is this alludes to the conversation that has been had. There are over 100 organizations that are doing tremendous work in Montgomery County. Uh, so what else is among them and absolutely is doing tremendous work in the food recovery space. Um, obviously, the Food Security Task Force, which is now evolving into the Office of Food Systems Resilience in real time, uh, evalu <clears throat> evaluates the needs across the, the county and uh, tries to develop uh, an equitable but also a, a sustainable mechanism for, for how we identify programs and projects. So I don't know where the miscommunication came with so what else in terms of them forward spending dollars, and that's obviously a huge problem to, to address. Uh, but what it, what it largely comes down to is the food recovery efforts are a critical component of the overall food system. They're not as necessarily as efficient because the, the food, food that you often recover is not as sustainable longer term or as it doesn't have shelf stability as long as some of the other food that you might produce in bulk or, or fresh fruits, uh, obviously, which have their own component to them. And so there was, I think, a largely a prioritization of other efforts around this, not to say that the work that someone else is doing is not important. It's just when, when, you, when you have all 100 plus organizations out there, it was just, uh, I don't think it was that the food recovery uh, money was deprioritized relative to the sustainable, self-stable self products that we have. So but I appreciate that, Mr. Stoddard, but was there a promise or a commitment made to them that they would be reimbursed for this money by anybody I in the do I, staff? And to my knowledge, no, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that, I, I don't, I'm not aware of where that promise would have come in, and certainly in, in my questioning of those, there, there is not a recollection of that. Um, and so I, I don't think there's, just so we're clear, the executive doesn't oppose uh, this, this uh, particular appropriation, but I do think that uh, Council Member Rice's uh, suggestion that you will have other organizations who will see this and then naturally follow along. And so I, I would say we need to figure out exactly where that message may have been misconstrued and figure out how we prevent that from in the future. But um, I, we can't find at this point what that where that message may have been relayed. You, you were getting ready to touch your mic. Do you have something to add? No, no I was just going to reiterate that the, uh, the breakout of what we're spending on was in the original proposal to the executive and it's what was pre presented to council. I believe there might have been discussions about possibilities of other organizations, but in terms of what was ever actioned upon and what was ever authorized for spending, it was only the organizations as was laid out in um, the approved budget, and that was what the non-competitive contracts that were sent over to council that council approved as part of the appropriation for this year. Okay. Well, I, you know, I um, obviously, you know, we're all extremely supportive of this work. It's been one of the best things that's happened at, coming out of the pandemic. Our focus on food security. We, I've done a lot with that, as you all know, with food from Montgomery and so many other things. And all my colleagues have been right there. Um, I do, I share Councilmember Rice's concern uh, about, you know, because I've, just because I've, we've all been doing this for a long time, everywhere I go, everyone I go, someone asks for, you know, 
a, a specific line item, and and we set up the food council for this purpose. So I, you know, I'm going to refer defer judgment because I've heard from I want to see what my other colleagues say that may be more privy to these conversations, but absent a commitment that was made, I don't think this would be appropriate. And so it's it's so just to be clear, the executive position is that there was not a commitment made for any funding. Okay. That's correct. We're not aware of any commitment that was made at any time. Okay. So I've Thank got you. Council Member Friedson followed by Council Member Vader, and then I have a suggestion. Council Member Friedson. Uh, appreciate it. Well, first of all, I think everybody here shares the same goals. I just want to be very clear about that. I don't think there's any intentional, uh, you know, you know, difference here or disagreement. Really, I think the question is some of the challenges that we face with. Uh, what clearly were some issues and uh, miscommunications that have taken place, and I think many of them were within the executive branch. And I think, you know, with respect, I think the executive branch has put the council in a very difficult position here and put partners who are doing this work in very difficult position uh, here. Uh, so, you know, I think that's what we're trying to navigate through and try to figure out what's the fairest and most reasonable way to move on from this issue and do right by partners of the county who have been asked to do work. So I guess the question, I have a few questions. Um, first, um, was this organization asked to submit a proposal by the Department of Health and Human Services? I believe they submitted a proposal and they, they do receive funding already through the Capillary Food Bank. I believe it's just not in the amount that they've spent down at this point. And so they have obviously been receiving funding. It's just the question. So, so yes, Related so, to this particular yeah. funding, were they was it suggested or asked that they submit a proposal? And was that discussed? For this, uh, for the, for the, the full amount of 130,000, no, not, not the, no. Okay, were, was, were there conversations with members of the Department of Health and Human Services about this particular proposal and about it being approved and it going through the process? Again, like to, to the answer, we, we're not aware of any conversations where any approval was given. There were discussions at various times with a whole bunch of different partners, uh, at, you know, in groups, in, in individual calls. But never was there a solicitation nor a commitment that the project was going to be funded. There are a number of projects that have been suggested over the course of the last year and a half around food that um, did not get included in the budget. Does Ms. Tato Niktash still work at the Department of Health and Human Services? Yes, she does. And so there were no conversations between her and the organization about this particular proposal and the process as, for getting it funded and when the funds would potentially be available? As was stated, there's conversations with lots of organizations when they're developing the budget and looking at possible items for spending. Um, so I'm, there was discussions, I believe, um, about um, possibilities, but there was never any commitment on the executive side. It was never included in the executive's budget when the budget was proposed and submitted um, for this to be funded as an item. Did anybody from Department of Health and Human Services ask the organization to support the hubs. We ask them to do work. I, 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 I'm, sh I'm speaking uh, not uh, out of full knowledge of that situation. I would say that I'm sure that we've asked. Um, we work with partner organizations to support the hubs, and lots of partner organizations support the hubs in lots of different ways. Some that are paid by the county, some that do it as a volunteer basis. So I, I'm not sure exactly. Um, our unfortunately our. Uh, person who runs our hubs is not available to be here this morning, but um, as far as I know, uh, that would be the answer. So I have a, I have a suggestion, Councilman Friedson, after after you finish yeah, your questions, I, and then Councilman Navarro is in the queue. I appreciate well. that. I, you know, I think the challenge here is we have a situation where organizations working with the county, the organization has been told certain things. There you know, may be a you know, discussion within the executive branch that is different from the discussions that are happening between the executive branch and the partner, but ultimately my view is if the department, you know, on behalf of the county is communicating with partner organizations and make certain requests and certain commitments, then we have an obligation to fill those commitments. Now, there's a process challenge here. We need to have a much better process for this moving forward, but ultimately I don't think it's fair or reasonable for organizations who are you know, asked to do certain work or who are told uh, certain things to, you know, have not have those uh, funding commitments 
uh, fulfilled. For that reason, I you know support the, the motion, but with that, I'll yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so um, I don't think, I can't recall a time that we ever did something like this on the fly like that, because there is something called process. And if for some reason there was a miscommunication or there were issues affecting a particular organization, I would have hoped that there would have been some you know, communication, written communication, perhaps via memo or something like that, um, in order to clarify this. But I personally did not, you know, participate in the, in the HHS uh, committee discussion. I can't, I'm not prepared to, to, to raise my hand for $130,000 just like that, especially because of what was just described, that we have an entire network of organizations that are providing, you know, these type of services. I mean, just yesterday I was at a meeting with an entire, you know, slew of organizations who are really having a tough time fulfilling the needs of some folks who are arriving here in our county. And so I, I'm just, I guess I'm just a little blindsided. I mean, I, I would have to abstain at least uh, because I, I don't think it, it just sets a precedent that I hope we would not uh, entertain. And I, at the, on the other hand, I do, I'm sensitive to what may have occurred and, you know, and, and, and hope that there could be another way uh, for us to perhaps come back to address that. But I think that again, just you know, one hundred thirty thousand dollars, just like that, um, you know, how do you then say no to all the other organizations that have come through? And um, and again, I, I just hope that there can be you know, with our six floor staff and and, and and everyone to come up with a, a way that um, that is a lot sort of cleaner in terms of process. Um, that that would be really important. But again, I think at best I would have to abstain from this vote. I, I don't have enough information to be able to make an informed decision on something like this. Okay, um, just to, uh, Council Mayor Katz, and then I have a suggestion, and then Council Vice President Glass would like to speak as well. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be very quick. What happens if they don't get the one hundred and thirty thousand? What happens to the organization? Uh, it's I mean it's difficult to say because if they've already spent. Yeah, some portion or all of the money, then obviously, then they're going to be in you know in deficit moving forward, which is which is the problem that is I mean, presented. One hundred thirty thousand dollars is a substantial amount of money for a nonprofit, especially Absolutely. to many organizations, and that becomes a concern. I I agree that that <laughs> there's obviously miscommunication. It might not have been on on your side. It might have been in other ways. I mean, you have a lot of conversations, and sometimes people hear what they want to hear and disregard the rest, but. I, I do think that we need to, if we don't appropriate it today, we need to go back and figure out what happened and, and what will happen to this organization who have already, if whatever they've spent, to help people uh, using this money. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Glass, then I'll give my suggestion. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Uh, I, I just want to make a comment in regards to Councilmember Navarro's comments, and uh, I, I it was only a few months ago that we were having a conversation about the hubs uh, and it was the executive's recommendation that one of the hubs not receive funding because of the process that you all had put forward and we the council decided we wanted to change that and so the precedent has been set that we have the final prerogative and we do what we think is fair and in this case I think restoring one hundred thirty thousand dollars is the fair thing to do Thank you. So, a um, couple of thoughts. Um, there is there is a process by which we followed this. This did come late uh, through our committee discussion, and none of us had the opportunity to fully vet and discuss this. And there had been an anticipation that colleagues in HHS were going to have different information than what was shared. And I don't think, um, I, while I very much respect the appropriation. I think that we need a little bit more time to figure out and give the executive branch the opportunity in a runway uh, to acknowledge that clearly there was miscommunication in some form or fashion. And we have to get the appropriation out today to be able to fund the other organizations. But I would humbly request right now that there be a meeting set up as soon as possible with this organization and that if there are resources that can be accessed within the executive branch, I worked in the executive branch for 12 years, I know there is always opportunities for us to uh, course correct uh, when necessary. Um, this council convenes one, two more times. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so we've got until November 15th uh, before we can formally take action as a body, and as you've heard from two of my colleagues, um, understandably, are very interested and passionate about making sure uh, that we make this organization whole. So what I'd like to recommend is that um, we revisit this item once again. We do have a motion and a second, which um, do you... Do you guys want to vote on it or go back to the... No, I, I think you... Okay. I, I think, the, uh, Mr. President, I think you've come up with, with a fair solution, having listened to our colleagues uh, and understanding the, the concern, uh, legitimate concern, but the only time we raise these issues is when we find a legitimate reason to raise them. And so I think we're all right in this scenario, and I think what you've suggested is a fair way to move forward. Okay, so... Yes, yeah, so I'll withdraw the motion, and I'll okay. agree to it. And um, we will follow up immediately, um, and we've got a lot going on these days, um, but obviously this is very important and something that we'll, we'll follow up with you to get an update on. If I may, just thank you. I mean, the, part of the reason we created the Office of Peace Systems Resilience, and we appreciate the Council supporting that effort, is to try and, uh, you know, create some more central control as opposed to the ad hoc food security task force that we had established under COVID that was doing much of the work and even up to the budget development process this year. So. We, we believe the streamlining of those efforts underneath the Office of Food Systems Resilience will help to alleviate some of these future future issues. But we agree that we do not want to have a nonprofit organization that is uh, whose future work is impugned or impeded by by an inability because of the past. So we agree we'll do the we'll do the research, figure out what happened, and then come back with additional information to the council. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, so we will follow up. But in the meantime, can I get a motion to accept the eight point one uh, eight million one hundred fifty thousand dollars supplemental appropriation? Moved by Councilmember Rice, seconded by Councilmember Katz. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous among all, uh, unanimous. Thank you. All right. Uh, we move on to the next item on the agenda, which are interviews for uh, uh, Montgomery County Planning Board temporary positions. Just going to make a couple of um, comments up front and first express my, and on behalf of all of my colleagues, tremendous appreciation to all of the county residents who stepped forward and applied for these positions. Uh, it was a very difficult decision to get down to the 11 extraordinary leaders that we are going to have the opportunity to interview shortly. But for members of the public, um, there have been a lot of conspiracy theories out there, and I just want to allay those. Um, this is this has been an unusual process to say the least, but a necessary one given the circumstances that led to the action that we're going to be taking later this week to appoint the temporary board. But I think it's important to acknowledge that um, this is the view of this council that the members that we are going to interview this afternoon are going to be appointed to temporary positions. That does not exclude them from the opportunity to apply for the full-term positions which will be advertised shortly after the next council takes office. But we felt it was important so that the planning board can continue its business along with the planning department and to recognize and honor the extraordinary professionals who have been caught in the middle of all of this. And also the important plans that are before the planning board right now we sought the application of people and we were so fortunate to have received the application of professionals who have a great deal of experience in this space, including former planning board members, including former elected officials, including people that work regularly uh, in this environment, which has been extraordinary. And so because of that, um, I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues and having tremendous confidence um, that this board uh, we'll build a bridge, and it is an entirely new council that will be determining who, if any of these members are interested in serving the full term, actually in fact serve the full term. Nothing is baked here. I just want to be very clear. Nothing is baked here. Um, this is simply an opportunity for us to get us through the next several months uh, and so that the planning board can continue its important work. So with that, um, what the way this is going to work today, as it does with every appointment process, is I will ask a series of six questions to three separate panels. My colleagues will then have the opportunity to ask one question themselves. And colleagues, I respectfully request that we keep to the five-minute rule so that we can get through all three panels 
and then go through a deliberation and discussion in, in the very short term. But I think that's uh, important to, uh, to, to adhere to. So I'd like to invite our first panel forward, uh, Mr. Raj Barkuma, Cherie Branson, Francoise Carrier, and Norman Dreyfus. Please come forward. Thank you again very much. So I'm um, going to ask, if you can, uh, to limit your responses to around two minutes. Um, but you know that's not hard and fast. If you need to go a little over that, that's OK. But just so we can get through this in a way that makes sense, uh, we will do this in alphabetical order, go down the list, and then reverse it on the way back. So uh, Mr. Raj Barkuma, we start with you. Thank you so much for coming today, sir. The first question is, what skills and experience do you have that is relevant to the work of the planning board? I'm an architect and planner for 40 years, I've been principal of my own firm and a managing principal for design and planning. I'm a 40 year resident of Montgomery County and I'm familiar with the process. Uh, as a former member of a uh, former national president of the American Institute of Architects, I had to deal with situations that were crisis oriented. I took office three years after the 1994 recession and the economy was in turmoil, which meant the membership was in turmoil. And so what we had to do was figure out how do we stabilize the economy of the architect, for the architect. And so that's one of the experiences I've had. And the other is I've taught full time for 30 years in architecture and planning, and my degrees are in education wise. I have a first degree in built environment and architecture. Uh, Master of Architecture from the University of Kansas on urban design and from the University of London in architecture and development planning and after I finished my term as national president I decided that I had to do something rather than be the former president and I went back and got a doctorate in sustainable design which I saw as being the coming uh, important issue and that was in 1997. So I was ahead of the curve on that, and I bring those skills plus planning and experience to bear on this. I've also sat and presented to panels such as yours and the Historic Preservation Board, the U.S. Fine Arts Commission, and other historic preservation and environmental groups, as well as being chair and juror for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Awards Program. Uh, the uh, U.S. Green Building Council Awards Program and the Anne Arundel County Development Design Awards Program, which uh, I helped to initiate. So I have a fair amount of sitting on the other side analyzing what someone's presenting as well as understanding how to do this un through science and fact-based uh, investigation. Thank you for your response. Mr. Dreyfus. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Branson, you are next. <laughs> We're going in alphabetical order. Thank you. Um, so, good afternoon, first of all. It's good to be here with you all. Um, let's see. As you all know, I was a member of the council and in that capacity, I had the privilege of learning a bit about the planning board, its policies, its procedures, its practices. Um, but I am by no means a subject matter expert. I have a certain proficiency. My expertise is in a few other things. My expertise is in figuring out how to fix organizations. As you all know, um, I came to the procurement office um, it was newly appointed, but I came at a time when there had been multiple <laughs> reports and dissatisfactions with that office. The council had set up task force, uh, task forces, um, and, and there had been a good deal of public 
alarm with what went on at, in the county's procurement processes. I'm happy to say that I was able to, to change that office. I was able to make it responsive to the public. Um, we streamlined procedures. We made it transparent. We um, implemented um, many programs that did public outreach so that people actually knew and understood what they needed to do. Um, before then, I was an oversight council for over 20 years in the federal government. As an oversight council, you know what you do is you do a deep dive. You figure out what's wrong and you figure out whether there are legislative or administrative solutions to whatever problems you find. You hope you don't find waste, fraud, and abuse, but sometimes you do. Um, you hope what you find are simply inefficiencies and then you figure out how to fix them. Um, so my experience, as I said, is in figuring out how to fix things. And while I think um, the planning staff is probably doing a fine job, the public perception does not, does, does not meet up with that. Um, and, and so I think it's important to have someone on the board who understands how to get the public to believe again in the process, how to make sure the doors are open so that people feel like they can participate, like their voices can be heard. Um, that's, that's what I would bring to this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carrion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I was served a full term as the chair of the Montgomery County Planning Board from 2010 to 2014. Um, and uh, during that time, I was uh, able through some combination of luck and skill, I suppose, to foster an environment of collaboration on the board. Uh, we had a very, um, we really worked together as a board, as a unit, and I think that we were very effective. Uh, during that four-year period. Um, we did some very big projects, lots of master plans, a zoning code rewrite, and of course, millions of square feet of development. It was, um, it was an honor to serve in that role. Um, and um, I guess uh, before that, I was a hearing examiner also for the county for nine years, and I conducted hearings on special exceptions and rezonings. I have um, a great deal of experience with running hearings, um, holding, the, holding the room together um, and helping people who appear before a body feel like they were listened to, even if the decision doesn't go their way. Um, it's, so, it's so important that people feel like someone actually heard what they had to say and considered their concerns. And I, I think that's a, a big part of the, the role of the chair and the other members on the planning board. Um, I have a wealth of experience in land use in Montgomery County, and I work as a land use lawyer, so um, all of that, I, I think, um, would allow me to step into this role um, with no, learn, no real learning curve, um, and which I think is what you need just at this moment for this short period of time where we're in kind of a crisis situation. I guess I should also add I have very good relationships with uh, senior management in the Parks Department and the Planning Department. Um, and I'm um, happy to say I enjoy good relationships with many members of the Council as well. Thank you. Mr. Dreyfus. Um, I was part of that collaborative board. Um, I served with three different chairs, uh, Royce Hansen, Francoise, and Casey. Um, I think the problem that I, I address, uh, and when I first heard about this, is not the staff, but the board. The relationship of the staff, the respect they have, the, their professionalism, integrity, was really challenged by board action that was not what the board should be doing. So the, the planning board should be what the staff can rely on to support them and enhance what they do. And um, 
That wasn't happening, but it happened under other boards. And I think that's what has to be restored. The staff will respond very positively for the board that respects them. And um, my career really has been solving problems. I started in the Navy, I got assigned lots of problems that I didn't think I was qualified for, but I managed to get through them. When I was with Carl Freeman Associates, they sent me to Sea Colony to run it in, on Memorial Day because the manager quit. And I was supposed to only be there for a summer. A year and a half later, um, I was brought back to Washington to help Mr. Freeman run the company because his main uh, executive team quit. Um, I started the Leisure World development with uh, Giuseppe Cecchi and IDI. Um, I worked with the community to get a consensus for the development. Every site plan, all 15 of them, uh, was supported by the community and the residents. There were no litigation, no uh, opposition to anything we did for almost 30 years. And it's phenomenal for condominium associations. So I think I'm qualified, both from experience on the planning board and experience in, on boards. And boards are not the chairman. The boards are all five members. Uh, they have to reach a consensus, I'd say, in my experience, 95% of what we did was by consensus. There was very little opposition. And the, to have a board member who votes four to one all the time is really not constructive. Our job as a minority, if we were a minority, is, is to be persuasive with the other members to get a majority to agree. And I think that's what has to happen at the board. Uh, it's not a place for politics. It's a place for hard work and support for the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Branson, we're going to start with you with this next question. And the question is, how would you help restore confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? Um, I think the best way to restore confidence is to, make the, is to help the staff understand that people are listening. Um, but I unfortunately do not think it's just about staff. Um, it's also about the public. You know, there are plans for a lobbying disclosure. Um, I think those plans have to be implemented. There are, there are concerns about open meetings. I think those concerns have to be, um, the, the plans to open those meetings have to be implemented. You know, as to the staff, um, the, the staff does have to understand that there is a place for them to go. There are people for them to talk to. You know, it's not my way or the highway. You know, the, these are the people who are the experts. They know what the, uh, what, they know the codes and the, and the, and, and all the legal mumbo jumbo that has to be included. They understand this. You know, and, and it is really important to make sure that they are heard, to make sure they are respected, to make sure that they understand the value, the absolute value of their contribution. Um, if they don't understand that, then what you will have is flight. You know, and that kind of brain drain is not good for Montgomery County in any way, shape, or form. So what I would try to do is to make sure that the staff does understand that their views are appreciated, that their perspectives may be from time to time questioned. You know, hard questions are not, um, are, are, are not things to be shied away from. You know, sometimes hard questions are how you get to, to different kinds of answers. So, um, and, and people who are professionals understand that. So that's what I would do. Thank you. Ms. Carrier? Um, you know, I, I think that um, it will, what will help the staff probably the most is just to feel that the agency is stable and the planning board is stable. I think that all the tumultuous events of the last few weeks have have created some a real insecurity um, about the future of the agency, the future of the planning board, the future of people's jobs. Um, so the presence of a new board will do a lot to help 
sort of lower the temperature on all of those concerns. Um, and, I, and I think that having, um, having some faces on that board that the staff know and, and trust um, would also be very helpful to have sort of um, you know, known elements, people that the staff know, love the county, love the agency, really have the, the future of the county and the agency um, you know, uppermost in their mind in approaching, um, you know, in approaching the task of restarting um, the planning board. Um, and I guess I would um, echo what other people have said about the importance of showing staff all the respect that they deserve. Um, you know, I found the last time around that that really was, that was the most important thing. That was the most basic thing. That's what people want. People want to be treated with respect. That includes the staff, that includes the applicants, that includes the community members who come before the planning board. And um, I, I know it sounds really basic and simple, but it, it's something that, that has to be um, done all the time. You know, every single occasion that has to be uh, a priority. So those, I think, are the factors I would depend on. Thank you. Now, Mr. Dreyfus, how would you help to restore the confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? Um, I've been on a lot of boards, um, and both in leadership position and in charge of committees, and uh, boards are not running the organization. The organization is run by the executive director in some cases, or the planning director and the parks director. Um, the board has to understand that those are the people we work with. We hire those people, and those are the only people that report to the board. The rest of the staff reports to them. And they have to feel that the board is not interfering with their operation w without dealing with them directly. When we have had meetings as uh, boards at the planning board, uh, we've met with the planning director or the parks director. And at their choosing, they bring to those meetings people that will support whatever position they're taking. Um, I think that's the most important thing as a board that we realize we're not running the organization. We're managing the key people who are running the organization. And it is not our job to go in in the nine years I was on the planning board, I never had an independent meeting with one member other than the planning director, not anybody. Um, and I think that's what they would respect as a board member that we should be doing. Um, they're running the organization. We're not happy. We deal with them. We don't deal with individuals in the organization. And once they understand they're being respected and listened to and they're in charge, I think things will settle down. Thank you. Mr. Barkuma. Absolutely. And you need to press your button. Uh, how would you help restore confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? You have to press the button right by your microphone. There you go. Thank you all for being so patient and inviting us here. I forgot to thank you for including me in this interview. It seems to me that every time there is a member of a board who's got support staff, it's not a separation of duties. It's in fact one team trying to get to the result that's expected. The result that's expected in my mind from the planning board is to make independent decisions based on facts presented, backed up by the research and information that's been gathered by the staff. When I was eight years old, my uncle who was a district judge said something that has stuck with me all the way. And that is, not only must justice be done, it must also be seen to be done. So I would say that restoring confidence in the board and in the staff, in the planning board and the staff, requires example from every one of the planning board members of impartial, fact-based judgment and recognition that staff is the most critical part of that decision-making process and respect them for what they produce. It's not a split screen up, upstairs, downstairs thing like in the old British system that I grew up in. So the 
idea that not only do we do it as a team, we must also be seen to be doing it. So I would strongly recommend that besides having these hearings on television and planning board, if we can get a regular column or a regular time slot in the local TV channels that, uh, that explains what the project was that was being presented and what decisions were taken, I think that would make for restoring confidence because transparency is really the most important critical part of a democratic process. And everything that you and us, we will do together is based on bolstering that transparency where every individual of the county has an equal right to say and get and expect proper service. Thank you for that response. Ms. Carrier, we'll begin with you for this next question. And the question is, what do you believe are the most critical issues the board needs to address other than restoring confidence uh, in the next few months? Hmm. I think that this um, interim board um, would best serve the process by not trying to make any big changes or big um, policy decisions. I don't expect this interim board to take on any master plans. The time is too short. Um, there may be, um, it may be appropriate to look into um, some of the actions of the prior, prior board, not the board members, interactions between board and staff. See if there are any discussions that need to be had to, uh, to clear the air. Um, there is, I understand, a, you know, a process that's being done to investigate class claims, and I don't think the planning board has anything to do with that process. Um, budget is coming up. Um, so this board will be deciding on the budget to propose to the council, and that's an important function. I understand, um, you know, from stuff I've seen on agendas that they've been working on the budget and the normal course of events, I suspect that this board will, that'll be one of the first things this board has to take up. Um, it, if, if there are, if there is a need for any kind of structural change, I suppose this board could make recommendations to the next board. I would personally, if I were on this board, I would be reluctant to, um, as I said, to make any big changes because I, I feel like this is just, this board is serving for such a short time period that that seems like m more than its role. Um, but there may be recommendations that this board could make to the next board or to the council um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dreyfus, same question. What are the most critical issues you believe the board needs to address other than restoring confidence in the next few months? Um, I'm here because it's interim. Uh, I have absolutely no interest of continuing after the interim period. And what I believe that means is to not introduce anything new, but let the staff and the board continue with the business that, it's, that it has to do it has to deal with the budget. There are regulatory things coming up. There are site plans and everything that happens on a Thursday has been left you know, off the table for the last three weeks. Um, three months, uh, we can catch up, make sure we do no harm, and uh, tee up the, the process, in my view, for the next board that's going to be long term. You will have time to interview and uh, go through all that process. I have a quick uh, story, and it's about uh, when I was, we had some friends at our house in uh, Fredericksburg at a lake, and we, the, after the young people spent their weekend, they wanted to take us out to breakfast. So we, they said, let's go to the Waffle House. So we went to the Waffle House in Fredericksburg. There's a line out the door. So I went in to see how long it was going to take. And I, as I walked in the door, I saw all the tables were empty, most of them, but they weren't bust. The girl behind the register was sitting there not doing anything, the cook was not cooking, and the guy doing dishes wasn't doing anything. So I said, well, can I talk to your manager? And they said, well, uh, he's out sick today. 
So I said, well, can I help? And he said, please. So I asked the girl at the register to go outside and give people menus and give us their order so that the cook had something to do. I asked the cook and the dishwasher and the guy to bust the tables so people could go in and sit down. Um, and by the time I was done, the place was operating and the line was gone. And I see that as the job here. This is what this is. My wife is reading the paper in Colorado and she turns to me and says, Waffle House. Mm. And, mm. <laughs> so that's how I see the problem and I think just getting the job done, getting everybody the support they need is, is going to go a long way and not doing anything new. Thank you. I appreciate that a lot. Um, Mr. Raj Barkuma, same question. What are the most critical issues, uh, what are the most critical issues you believe the board needs to address other than restoring confidence in the next few months? You need to press your button again, the one right by the, you need to press your, sorry about that, sir, your button, there you go. Perfect. Oh, stand, sorry. The, uh, most important things to be doing is to re-understand, especially when you have a brand new board, I think you get a new broom to sweep. That means that we need to know what we are sweeping and what we are going to save, which means going back to the core purpose of the planning board. Uh, sometimes when we've been doing something for a while, we tend to stray from the main purpose. And if we manage to get back to doing what we are supposed to do, do it to the regulations, that are in force and keep meticulous records of everything that takes place. You don't have to make a new invention of what has to be done. It's just simply a matter of getting it done the proper way. Nothing under the table, nothing in the cash box, just straightforward dealing and very upright behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Branson. Yeah, I think um, that people have pretty much said what needs to happen. I mean, the first thing that needs to happen is the budget. I mean, that, that becomes a, a real important thing. Um, but after that, um, normalize, stabilize, play catch up, and set the table for the next group of people. I mean, those are the things that really have to be done in the next, you know, three or four months or however long. Um, and and if if this interim, if an interim board is able to do those things, then I think they will have gone a long way toward um, establishing um, a sense of accountability, um, a sense of calm. Um, and a, a sense that, you know, we, we, have, we have come back to even keel. We, we have come back to being the kind of government Montgomery County expects. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dreyfus, this next question is for you. Um, it's a little long, so bear with me. And if you need me to repeat it, I'm happy to do that. Um, all right, yes. Um, so the question is, um, what role should the planning board take in addressing racial equity and social justice issues? So that's the first part of the question. And then how can lessons learned during the council's review of the racial equity and social justice components of Thrive, such as culturally and linguistically proficient outreach and engagement, be incorporated in future planning endeavors? Um. I have to tell you honestly, I was not involved in Thrive. It happened after my tenure and I don't know much about it. Uh, I do know that the council passed it and so our job will be to implement it and I'm going to rely on the staff that wrote it uh, to help uh, make sure it's followed. Um, I really don't know much about the aspects you've raised. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, I appreciate the response and your candor. Um, Mr. Barkuma, same question. Uh, what role should the planning board take in addressing racial equity and social justice issues? 
How can lessons learned during the Council's review of the racial equity and social justice components of Thrive, such as culturally and linguistically proficient outreach and engagement, be incorporated in future planning endeavors? I need you to hit your button again. There you go. Social justice is built into the system, and what we have to do is to make sure that we are being fair by everyone, that there is full access, full availability of all services, and I'm um, um, generalizing this because the question came at me, I don't want to talk to a specific issue, but I would imagine that if someone was homeless and sleeping on the streets, we would do something to help them. That would be one aspect of it. And that's a planning board action, I suspect. Affordable housing definitely falls under that. The aspiration is that we would have a vibrant, livable society which has, provides the most amount of support to enrich the quality of life. And that would be, at the social justice level, approaches it, get the basic shelter provided, provide, find ways of doing that, and there are many ways in which it can be done. Uh, we can't uh, do anything to increase their income, but we can certainly give them job training. And so I would think that social justice pans out from the planning board to affect other departments within the system. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, I appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Branson. Um, so, as I understand it, um, many of the complaints about social justice and equity in, uh, in Thrive 2050 um, have to do with concerns about outreach, um, concerns about inclusion, um, and concerns about um, of the residents of being gentrified and displaced you know those are very real concerns for people um, the the solution if you will um, will not come overnight I mean I think it's it is really important to read and understand the racial impact statements that the office um, does that um, that the council office, you know, does, um, and and to really try to implement those. As far as you know, on a short term basis, I think what can happen is that you know people need to feel included. They need to understand that their views have been heard. I, you know, have been a part of a few of those outreach sessions. Um, and frankly, um, did not feel as though people in the community had the full benefit of, of being heard. Uh, on one hand, I can understand the pandemic probably limited a lot of, of uh, the planning board's ability to get out and talk to people. Sometimes what people will say on a Zoom call is very different than what they will say you know, when, when they're out at a community building, you know, surrounded by their neighbors and they understand that they are, they are in a place where people understand them. Um, but, but as we come out of the pandemic, I think it would behoove us to understand how to get back out into the community, how to reach out to people in a way that they understand, meet people where they are. You know, that's, that's always the big deal with outreach, meeting people where they are, listening to what they say, taking that back to the office and figuring out how you improve upon what folks have told you is their concern. You know, and then you go out and you do it again. You know, and you keep doing it until, in, until you feel like you have something that makes sense and will actually help to shift the balance. Let's be for real. This county is majority minority. We cannot, we cannot continue to pretend like um, we're not. You know, this is who we are. Welcome to MoCo. We are a different kind of place, and if we don't bake equity in the cake, 
we will not be happy in 10 years. Things will quickly fall apart. The time is now to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carey? Um, you know, when I was with the planning board before, there was a lot of effort already starting at that time to try and figure out how to improve outreach, how to improve participation, how to reach the portions of the county's population who historically had not been involved very much in the land use and planning process. Um, and I, I know that the staff made um, and the planning board made tremendous efforts in that regard with regard to Thrive as well as plans that preceded it. Um, you know, clearly there was room for improvement. You know, there's the council made additions to the document um, to, you know, in that direction, and I, um, I, I hope that I think that that's an opportunity for the planning board and the staff to take a fresh look at it. You know, the park and planning has been a leader in um, professional planning circles for decades, an organization that is looked up to and considered a model. Um, and there is every reason for this that organization to be a model in this field as well. You know, we have a tremendous opportunity because of the diversity of our county. We, this, you know, this is the place where this should happen. If it can be done effectively, it can be done effectively in Montgomery County. So I think it's a challenge that the planning board and the staff can rise to. And, and I know that there's goodwill um, to try and do that. So um, that would be my hope. Thank you. Um, the next question I just want to make clear for some context here. I'm asking the same question of all 11 candidates, and this is again in the spirit of full transparency. It's a fairly straightforward uh, question, but just so that our public understands um, all the information the council has as we deliberate. And that question is, um, would you be interested in serving as chair? <laughs> uh, it's just the simple question. So. Mr. Uh, yes, Buckley. I would, uh, and I welcome the opportunity to bring the leadership skills I've learned over in very large organizations and small ones. And the leadership style would very simply be inspire everyone to do their best. Thank you. Ms. Branson. Probably not. No problem. <laughs> Um, um, if, if, if it was necessary, I would, but, uh, it's not my first, gotcha. not my first pick. No problem. <laughs> and there's no right or wrong answer. Okay, here. I good. want to make that clear. <laughs> um, Ms. Carriette. Uh, yes, I would be prepared to serve as chair. Thank you. Mr. Trifles. I would also, but if it's, um, available as a member, that's fine too. Gotcha. Thank you. And then the final question is, are there any potential conflicts of interest uh, which we should be aware, and that I should make a last question for me. Um, uh, my colleagues will have an opportunity to ask a question as well. Um, so uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Barkuma again. Thanks, Raj. <laughs> what, what's the question again? Sorry, the question is, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? That's a very good question. I really have no guidelines to tell you about, but I would do uh, inspiration, prayer, and dedication. That would be my three-part approach to it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Again, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Ms. Branson. No. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Carrier. Well, yes. Um, I, you know, I am a practicing lawyer with a practice that includes appearing before this body and the planning board. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought about that long and hard before putting my name in because it's, um, it's, a very, it's a very serious issue that really requires a lot of care. And I, I think that I can serve in the interim position um, without having any actual conflicts of interest by taking some, in, some very clear steps Obviously, I would recuse myself from anything coming before the planning board that involves my law firm. Um, I, I have a, a colleague who will, if I am appointed, who will be taking over um, the matters that I have that are active and that 
would be coming to the planning board at some you know at some point in their lifetime. Um, you know, uh, we took a look at our caseload to see how many of those items are likely to come up in the space of the three months that I sort of uh, projected as the time period. And it looks like there might be three to five items um, between, uh, you know, with the firm's whole land use practice. There's only two of us, so it's not, um, you know, this would be much more difficult if I were in a firm with eight land use lawyers. Um, so there are a couple of items that are um, very minor, not substantive. There are two substantive matters that I think are likely to come before the planning board during the interim, the life of the interim chair, and um, I would leave the room for those matters. Um, I also um, intend to be very, very careful, if I am appointed, not to be involved in any conversations with staff or planning board members about things that they may not know I have a client with an interest in. So I, you know, I plan to be very alert to that. Um, if there are, just to make sure that I don't want to, um, I don't want to receive any information that I would not be privy to as a, as a member of the private bar if it relates to something a client of mine is gonna come back with um, once I'm back in the private sector. And I would not want to unintentionally impart information to the staff or the other planning board members that um, that is that it that would not come to them in the normal course of events. So um, there is a possibility, and I, I I would be very much dedicated to avoiding the appearance or the reality of any conflict of interest. I appreciate that comprehensive response and your transparency. Thank you, Mr. Dreyfus. Uh, the simple answer is no. I am an executive vice president and board member of IDI Group Companies headquartered in Arlington. All of our development is in Virginia. Uh, there is no property or potential of anything in Montgomery County. And I am a limited partner in an investment property that has also no plans or opportunity to do anything in front of the planning board. So, no. Thank you. Um, Colleagues, uh, I just in some quick conversations here, uh, those were very elaborate and comprehensive responses um, that were very impressive. Um, and oh, Miss Branson, you did you, you, you did answer? Yes, yes. It was, just quick. It, it was short. Yes. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we do have two more panels to get through today, and then a deliberation that we have to have after. So. Um, I really want to thank all of you. I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues and expressing our deepest appreciation for your willingness to serve, and we will be following up. Mr. Dreyfus, would you consider opening a restaurant in Montgomery County? Waffle House, yes. It would be a Waffle House. That's right. I think they let me do that because they thought I was in the restaurant business, but I wasn't. <laughs> Levity today is good, believe me. Uh, all right, let's move on to our second panel. Thank you again. I'd like to invite forward uh, Ms. Barbara Goldberg-Goldman, Mr. David Hill, Mr. William Kerwin, and Mr. Vincent Napoleon. Thank you all again. Uh, all 11 of you, as well as everyone who has applied, has extraordinary resumes and we appreciate your interest. And uh, we, I will be asking the same six questions of all of you and once again we'll do this in alphabetical order and then work our way through. So uh, Ms. Barbara Goldberg Goldman, you will be first up. And the first question is, what skills and experience do you have that is relevant to the work of the planning board? So I, I'd like to break it into two pieces because the first set of skills I think go along on a much broader um, t context as dealing with uh, before any board. I'm a good listener. I talk when I have something to say. I say ditto a lot when I need to. Uh, I feel that uh, I am and I have demonstrated an enormous amount of respect for staff and for people coming before a board. I have a, a very sincere interest 
in understanding the needs uh, and and uh, and desires of people that do come before the board. Uh, I'd like to take broad brush strokes when necessary, as well as small scalpel-like um, looks at look at things. Um, as far as the planning board is concerned, in this interim period, um, I I have skills that are are tried and true when it comes to damage control, when it comes to dealing with upheaval internally in an organization, as well as externally in dealing with the public. Uh, I have a good appreciation for the image of an organization as well as the internal operations of an organization. I think I am very well suited for this position, certainly on an interim level. And I want to say that I am most honored to be selected as one of the finalists, certainly amidst uh, some people who I consider to be leaders in the county who have incredible experience. And um, I, I know some of them. I have worked with some of them at the planning board. Um, and I have worked with some, some of them outside of the planning board. But I think I am equipped and skilled and certainly ready and willing and able to do the job that is required in this interim period. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hill, you are next. Uh, what skills and experience do you have that is relevant to the work of the planning board? I come at this from municipal experience. I was a land use commissioner for the city of Rockville for 20 years. I served 10 years on the Board of Appeals and 10 years on the planning commission and was senior commissioner for five years. Um, I'll also mention that I sat on the committee that rewrote the city zoning ordinance about 10 years ago and uh, also uh, was the senior commissioner for most of the city master plan cycle for 2040 that we've just culminated. And I co-chaired the Charter Review Commission. So I have a, a lot of experience um, dealing with parliamentary activity and committee activity, how to balance staff with public submission, with um, advocate counsel, um, and uh, I won't elaborate further on that. Um, I believe I can do this as an interim position from that experience, and uh, it's, uh, it's, I can hit the ground running. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kerwin? Uh, for me, I think it starts with uh, being a lifelong resident of Montgomery County and growing up in the Long Branch, uh, downtown Silver Spring uh, neighborhood, um, where at that time, in the late 60s and 70s, um, it was uniquely a diverse place to live. Um, and it was, uh, it was sort of the precursor for what the county is today, uh, more broadly. Um, and that gave me experience uh, and made me, I think, colorblind is the inappropriate term to use uh, these days. I think it's more color acuity um, that I feel I have, where I can uh, see the vibrance of diversity in our community and, uh, and where we must, uh, we must respect that. Um, I think uh, my 34 years of professional experience, uh, as well as being backed uh, by my, uh, my degree, my professional degree uh, in a land use profession as an architect, uh, where I've guided my clients um, through uh, the important process of helping them envision their future, and I think that's the role the planning board plays in helping the county uh, envision its future. Um, and uh, my 10 years of service on the Historic Preservation Commission, five years as its chair, um, gave me the, uh, the experience and the procedures and the decorum that I think is expected of a planning board member. And uh, lastly, I think it's the, uh, my credentials as a U.S. Green Building Council lead accredited uh, professional, um, which I think the board has been lacking for many years, um, gives, uh, you know, will help me to bring um, environmental stewardship uh, objectives to, uh, to our deliberations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Napoleon, same question. Mr. President, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to be here today to uh, speak with you about this very important position. As I uh, respond to your question, I'd like to at least uh, give you a little understanding of who I am, uh, because I think that's important not only for you, the council, but also for the public. Uh, I am a long-term resident of Montgomery County. I raised my family here in the county, and my son attended independent schools here. I'm civic-minded. Uh, serving as a board member of several community organizations, including the executive board of the National Capital Area Council of the Boy Scouts. I'm also an attorney who has been practicing for more than 30 years, having served as general counsel of two public companies and divisions of significant Fortune 100 companies. 
I've also served as chair of the corporate group of the Office of the City Solicitor in Philadelphia, where I presided over significant real estate transactions and significant infrastructure projects. In addition, I served with the United States Air Force for 30 years, where I was at the rank of colonel. I think what's also interesting about my background and my experience and what I bring to the table uh, is uh, uh, having been exposed to multiple sectors, uh, the aerospace and maritime uh, sector, biotechnology, consumer uh, goods, uh, the government, both local and federal, uh, healthcare, uh, heavy industries, professional services, and technology and advanced technology, all of which are very central uh, to the future economic uh, interests of this, this, this county and, and certainly to the way in which land and land use is actually uh, exercised here in this county. I've also had, as I mentioned, um, served as a senior legal executive in a municipal setting. Uh, while in Philadelphia and chair of the corporate group, I led as part of that the real estate group which we were involved in significant uh, uh, infrastructure projects, including the construction of the Philadelphia Convention Center, uh, as well as uh, having uh, uh, performed on and supported P3 projects with respect to the Philadelphia International Airport, where we actually built the international terminal as well as the commuter terminals coming out of Philadelphia. Uh, in addition, I would say that given those uh, set of experiences, I've been uh, involved and I do understand the cross-branch, meaning legislature and, and executive, uh, dynamic. Um, having uh, routinely interacted with mayor, the mayor, members of the city uh, council, and other public officials, I think that helps me uh, during this interim period in being able to uh, add to the stability of, of the board and certainly uh, add to the interaction that I believe the board ought to have uh, with council and with the public. Uh, I would also uh, say that there have been a number of other experiences uh, in, in, in uh, terms of uh, my municipal uh, experience. Uh, but I think as a result of all those experiences, uh, what I bring to the table uh, is uh, uh, stability, thoughtfulness, and creating a compliant and ethical environment, which I think is important. But more importantly, I think independence is very important uh, in coming to, into this role. I think uh, new to the planning board, I believe I will bring the kind of independence uh, and thought that uh, would result in fresh eyes on issues uh, and certainly uh, results in uh, an ability to uh, expedite and certainly uh, uh, engage in the planning board activities in a way that would implement in a very fair and equitable way. Uh, in addition to independence, I, I think I will bring to the planning board an ability to be even-handed, apply even-handed considerations of concerns of all interested parties, uh, an understanding of the importance of land use decisions uh, uh, on our county and its future, and a willingness to listen to all sides, uh, the capability to ensure a fair and transparent process in considering the viewpoints of residents, developers, or others, and a strong desire to advance the public good, which I think is important. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, the next question, uh, we will start with Mr. Hill, is how would you help restore confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? In responding, I just want to turn that on its head quickly because I think I can take supporting staff uh, quickly here, which is, you know, staff are professionals. We expect them to be professionals. As board members, we need to communicate our expectations and have reasonable expectations of them. And I think an important thing for staff who is often vilified when it comes to public processes is to make sure that we're defending staff reasonably. Yeah, sometimes staff does do things that, that are, that are uh, worth noting, but um, we certainly shouldn't be uh, persecuting them in public session. Um, regarding public confidence, which is a much bigger matter and a harder one to get our hands around, um, uh, I, I think that it, doing a good job is a basic point for the interim period. Uh, doing a quality job without flash um, and making sure that the public good is serviced in the process. Um, an awful lot of land use planning comes down to whose ox gets gored, like the metaphor. And one of the things I've always focused on as a commissioner is making sure that if your ox is the dead one on the field, that you understand why and you understand the public particularly can get lost in our sort of arcane processes. 
So explaining things to the public, I think, is critically important in establishing public confidence. Um, I also make sure that unspoken understandings that occur in all the gyrations of planning get are handled transparently and explained as well as they can be. And here is an example. Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that there's a lot of conspiracy theory flowing around, around the public out there, and I'll take this opportunity to testify publicly that no one prompted me to stand for the service, and I have spoken to very few people about any detail of the service, and the only communication I've had with your body is through your administrative staff regarding application, what we had to do, and the details of being here today. And I think that's a common experience for everyone or that's speaking to you. So there is no conspiracy. I don't perceive that uh, this body is pushing through something. What you are doing is trying to sustain the public services, critical public services of the county government in good order for you know. Thanks, I appreciate that, that was well said. Um, so uh, same question, Mr. Kerwin, uh, how would you help restore confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? Well, I, I think you all have already taken that first step. I mean, there's, I'm sitting up here today with 10 very impressive candidates for this position and I've already heard from, from uh, former colleagues in the planning department, parks department, and general public who, uh, who are very relieved of the bliss that you guys have put together. Um, so I think that's, uh, th that's the important first step. I think once you make those selections, the, the five who are selected um, really need to roll their sleeves and get the work done. There's, there's, um, we've already lost several weeks of development proposals that need to move forward. We need to restore that confidence uh, in addition to the staff and the public, to the development community. Um, so that we keep those projects here in, in Montgomery County and, uh, and those who are planning projects uh, keep those in Montgomery County. Um, but I th it's, it's also the professionalism that I think has to come with, uh, with this position. Um, I think putting together this, this list of, of um, appropriately trained and experienced professionals is going to you know, instill that confidence um, and that's what I'm hearing out there in the community. Thank you. Thank you. So before I start, I just want to say to my colleague over here, go Phillies. <laughs> um, as you know, I have been uh, chair of the Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County for 33 years. Uh, I have also been chair of the Housing Opportunities Commission. I was on the commission for 13 years, maybe 13 plus, but I chaired for an unprecedented term for five years. In that five-year period, we encountered enormous upheaval and turmoil. There are some parallels to what was going on here with the council and the planning board, but then there were some very vastly different situations and circumstances. Um, the engine that makes any organization run is the staff. And I think at the planning board, we have incredible people. We have well-educated experts in their fields. They need to be reassured that their jobs are safe. They need to be reassured that they are valuable and valued by the staff. And they need to understand that they are depended upon by the board. If we need an ombudsman, maybe institute something like that. Uh, if we need to be able to have monthly or in this case I would assume weekly or bi-weekly meetings with staff. There are 140 planning staff members and 800 uh, parks and, and the chairman certainly knows that better than, uh, or the president, excuse me, knows that better than anyone. 800 employees. It's almost a thousand people that are looking in saying what is going on? What does my job look like? Who's listening to me? I don't know what to do. And they, they need to be reassured that they're okay and they're safe and that they're protected. That goes along with an image, the image of the agency. I, I often quote Aristotle, but I think I'm, I'm misusing the quote, which is the, the, um, the whole is much greater than, than the parts. Um, in this case, the council, and the agency uh, are greater than the small parts. And so the image is very important. Staff needs to also recognize 
that the image of the organization or the agency is most important in the public. There are reasons why park and planning has received awards over decades. There are reasons that park and planning has been lauded way beyond Montgomery County's borders and throughout the country. And much of that reason is because of the staff. But the stories need to be told. There needs to be business as usual. Uh, there is too much on, on the plates of the staff as well as the board members. The budget certainly is critically important. I know I've had probably too much experience looking at budgets. Um, I'm used to it. But that's important. And we need to make sure that there is, I, I, I don't mean to use a Hebrew word, but I'm going to, and some people may understand it. It's called um, shalom bait. It means peace in the house. We need to establish peace in the house. There needs to be a calm, and there needs to be an image from the outside looking in that we are business as usual, we are together, the board members must work as a team, we must be all on the same page, nobody goes rogue, there is one point person to talk to the press that likes to generate stories, that likes to dig up accusations and falsities that they know really nothing about. They shouldn't know, we don't need to know everything. But I think that I am well equipped to be able to deal with that upheaval. Thank you so much, Mr. Paul. Mr. President, I, I will quote John Dunn. Button. Mr. President, I, I will quote John Dunn. No man is an island. Every man is a part of the main. Meaning that the board can't do without the staff and the staff cannot do without the board. The board is very critical, I'm sorry, the staff is very critical uh, to the success of the board. And it's critical in driving solutions, I believe. Uh, and so I think as we begin to um, um, uh, look at the, the, the intricate understanding of the question that you posited, I think it's important to understand that running through that, that theme is a the notion of trust and leadership. And so if indeed the, the, the staff can understand that they can rely on the board and that there's leadership that will allow for that interaction uh, and that they can trust the board as much as the board can trust the staff, I believe there is real uh, opportunity here for success going forward uh, in the interaction between both the staff uh, and the board. Thank you for those responses. Uh, we move on to the next question, Mr. Kerwin. We'll start with you. Uh, what are the most critical issues that you, do you, you believe the board needs to address other than restoring confidence in the next few months? Well, I think getting the workflow going again. I think that's the most important thing, the interim board, uh, the role they'll play um, in the next, next several months. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's um, uh, it, it's also about, you know, as I mentioned before, it's uh, it's about you know restoring confidence in the development community too. I mean, I think that's that's uh, that's going to be critical. Um, but it's uh, it's really about rolling the sleeves up and getting the work done. I mean, I think that's that's why I stepped up to the plate um, to try to help out, offer my uh, services to help out, and uh, that's that's uh, I think the most important step. Thank you, Mr. Pauline. Thank you again, Mr. President. I think uh, as we look uh, forward here, I think it's important initially uh, for the board uh, to be involved in creating a stable environment. And it's from that stable environment that we can sort of lift off and provide a trajectory uh, for being able to work on those issues, the pipeline issues uh, that exist within the board as we speak today. Uh, those that, that have not uh, uh, been addressed because of uh, uh, the issues with which we're we're currently dealing. I think it's also important too that uh, an enhanced interaction between the board and the staff, as I mentioned earlier, uh, becomes very important in being able to address those pipeline issues and certainly in creating that very stable environment. But more importantly than anything, there has to be a relationship, a very good working relationship between the board and the council. And it's that interaction that I think will drive everything sort of top down as well as bottom up, in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Goldberg. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say ditto. Um, 
I think that it is critically important that the relationship between the board and staff are kept professional and, the, and there is an exchange of respect for the board's role as well as for the staff's role. So in terms of um, where we go from this point moving forward, we must be cognizant of what the jobs are that must be done. And business as usual must move ahead. And so once there is an understanding of top down and bottom up and what is on the plate, whether it be budget or uh, a zoning, a zoning uh, issue, uh, a setback issue, anything. It has to be something that everybody feels they are being heard, they are listened to, and they are respected. That is among the staff, that is among the board, and that is also among the people coming before the board. They need to feel that sense of trust and confidence that it's not really broken, it's just different, it's changed, and we have to evolve with that change. And so I believe uh, from the bottom of my heart that this can be done. It won't be easy because there are always people in the background that need to create trouble. They need to stir something up. They need to have the drama. We have to prevent that. We have to work as a team, a team not just among the board members, but a team with the staff and the board working together, responding to the council. Thank you. Mr. Allen. I think the most critical issue facing this interim service is carrying it on and continuing to conduct public business. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, I think as interim members, we should very be circumspect about what we commit um, of the permanent board to because we're there for only a very short period of time. And um, it's really a matter of keeping the, the operations going. Um, when I hear you say critical issues, I'm thinking of substantive issues as well. And in the interest of brevity, I will just say, one of the critical issues I'm worried about in the county is whether smart growth is faltering. And I'll leave it to you all to follow up with a question if that you'd like to hear more, but um, that's, a, that's a critical issue to me. Thank you. All right, so that takes us to the fourth question, and Mr. Napoleon, we'll start with you. Uh, and again, it's a little long, so bear with me. Uh, but what, what role should the planning board take in addressing racial equity and social justice issues? How can lessons learned during the Council's review of the racial equity and social justice components of Thrive, such as culturally and linguistically proficient outreach and engagement, be incorporated in future planning endeavors? Mr. President, as you know, uh, uh, this county has been uh, laden with uh, significant uh, racial justice equity issues uh, through a number of years. Uh, and that's inherent in some of the earlier general plans that have actually uh, been promulgated uh, by both the board and the council. Um, I, I, I'm very happy to see and, and, uh, and, and hear uh, that uh, as a result of the passing of the uh, Thrive 2050 uh, 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 resolution this morning, that we now can begin uh, the process of addressing some of those uh, racial uh, injustice uh, equity issues. Uh, things like redlining, for example, uh, are the kinds of things that uh, have no place uh, in this county and certainly uh, in uh, Thrive 2050 going forward. Uh, what I see now is an opportunity for the board in conjunction uh, with the council uh, to begin a process of implementing the tenets uh, of uh, Thrive 2050. And there are a number of things that will be done during the course of, of, of the years going forward in which that will happen. Uh, and it will happen as a result of uh, applications being filed with the board, uh, plans being filed, um, uh, land use uh, applications uh, being filed. Uh, and we'll be able to, as, as a board, uh, either through this interim board as well as in the permanent board, uh, to make a difference in ensuring that the racial justice equity issues are protected and are preserved through that process. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Goldberg-Goldman? Well, as, as chair of the Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County and as coming before the, the 
planning board on multiple occasions, working with them in agreement, working with them in disagreement. Uh, I know that many of you know that Thrive is near and dear to me. So I want to congratulate the board for that passage. Uh, have we come a long way? Yes, we certainly have. Uh, from wedges and corridors in the 60s to an, uh, a rewrite in the 90s, and all the while our, our demography has been changing dramatically. As one of the other candidates uh, mentioned, we are a minority majority county. And I like to think of us as in broad strokes that these needs of the variety, the rich cultural, ethnic, religious diversity in this county, those needs are being met, but they're not yet. I believe that Thrive, which is not a codified in stone law, it is a guide for us. It's an affirmation of what needs to be done, what needs to be looked at over the course of the next 30 years. I like to look at it through an equity lens. And by equity lens, I mean that we put on glasses and put in our brains the idea of we are one Montgomery and we have variety of needs for a very diverse population. I'd like to be able to take uh, an overlay and look at where certain things were done over the course um, of the last of the last half a century quite frankly where are the parks are they accessible to everybody is everybody able to have the ball fields for their children that they can play on and feel that this too is their home so while we have made great strides 100 percent absolutely we have a lot of strides yet to make. And those strides are dictated by, yes, mistakes that were made in the past, but what the needs are today. We need to look at racial, ethnic, gender, religious um, uh, equality and equity, and we need to address them, and we need to do it now. This is, yes, we have Thrive over a 30-year period, but now is the time that we can take action. And the people sitting up there, where you are, have an obligation to do it, and the people sitting on the planning board have an obligation to do it. This is not a situation, with all due respect, not to, I don't want to, um, to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but this is not in the 60s where a bunch of white men were dictating what everybody's needs were. That's not what we are, that's not who we are. And that's why Montgomery County has been called an enlightened community by Utney Magazine. It said that Montgomery County is the most enlightened community in the country and the best place in which to live. We need to make that come true. We need to follow up on where the voids are and make up for that right now. It's not, oh, we have a nice plan, let's put it on the shelf, no. No, we need to put on the equity lenses, we need to see where it is, where we are lacking, and we need to deal with it and not say, yeah, incrementally we can, because that's what's been done, let's face it. They have been incremental improvements. We don't have time for that any longer because our population should demand not to do it any longer. That's where I am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hill? Yes, I assure you I'm certainly conversing with equity issues, but pragmatically speaking, you are talking to candidates who will serve for three or four months. And building on a prior answer, I think it's important that we don't overly commit in that very temporary period of time the county government to actions that need more consideration. Um, it strikes me that um, land use um, is generally a balance between private property rights and the public good, and it's usually driven by legality, ordinance process, and national planning. And certainly, equity issues fall in the realm of public good. And when we can insert those and consider those, we very much should. But those really only come into play in process and uh, the extent that ordinance and master planning improve, includes them. And I believe the Thrive effort does include that. And that's a good aspirational step forward. It's going to take time to implement it. Uh, I will just say that crest behind you for the county, if I translate correctly, is uh, the motto is you guard well, and I will strive to do that in the limited time uh, if I serve. Thank you. 
Well, I think the general plan that you uh, passed today uh, gives us a lot of tools to address these issues. Um, most notably, I think, is housing and transportation equity. And if given the opportunity, the, uh, the interim board should do whatever they can to promote those issues. Um, uh, but I, you know, in, in the short term that they'll serve, uh, that'll probably be something that'll be passed on to the, uh, to the next planning board. Um, and uh, you know, in, in regards to some of the um, public concerns uh, regarding outreach, I think it will be the role of this, uh, this interim board to do whatever they can to, to uh, promote that awareness and, uh, and training um, for planning department staff uh, to make sure we address those concerns going forward. Thank you. All right, um, as I said to the last panel, this question I'm asking of all candidates, just for full transparency, um, are you interested in serving as chair? So Mr. Kerwin, we'll just start with you. Uh, I applied only for a membership position on the board. Mr. No. Okay. No. Okay. Mr. Yes, sir. Yes, I believe I could serve as chair given my leadership experience. Great. And the final question is, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Um, why don't we just go down the list again, Mr. Kerwin? Uh, the only conflict of interest uh, with regard to my uh, serving as a uh, interim plan board member is our office occasionally does uh, work for Montgomery County Public Schools um, and sometimes those projects have to come before the planning board for mandatory referral and in those instances I would recuse myself from those deliberations. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Essentially no, but in the interest of being exhaustive, I will disclose that I work for a large business in the county that uh, primarily does social science research that our very presence and, and size in the county, uh, if I am encountering problems with that, mm -hmm. recusal is the obvious solution. And I will mention very vaguely that I'm a director for a nonprofit that uh, primary location is in a state park in Prince George's County. And very vaguely, as part of service on the, park in, the National Park and Planning Commission, that might also have something, something of an umbrella. And if so, recusal is the appropriate answer. But in the short period of time, I don't expect that to be a problem. Thank you. So, so I am the chair and founder of, uh, co-chair and founder of the Affordable Housing Conference of Montgomery County. Uh, we often weigh in on certain uh, agenda items that are brought before the Park and Planning Board, uh, as well as the council. Uh, I would be willing to recuse myself if need be in those instances. I do know that there was a situation where we had a co-chair of the Affordable Housing Conference serve on park and planning. I didn't see any conflicts there. But I am a firm believer that there should be no perception that there is any uh, conflict of interest any way, shape, or form. And so if need be, I would certainly uh, be willing uh, begrudgingly to step down from the Affordable Housing Conference after 33 years, um, but certainly on an interim basis, uh, I, I would do that. Thank you. Mr. Pauling. No. Great. All right. Thank you all very much. You acquitted yourselves well. We appreciated the responses. And we will now move on to the third and final panel. Um, I'd like to invite forward Mr. Roberto Pinheiro, uh, Ms. Amy Presley, and Mr. Jeff Sainz. Stretch. Thank you all again so much uh, for joining us. Six questions. We'll do this in alphabetical order. And Mr. Pinedo, we're going to start with you. Um, the first question is, what skills and experience do you have that is relevant to the work of the planning board? And let me just state up front, as I did with the other two panels, thank you very much for your interest and your dedication and your public service and your willingness to serve. Mr. Pinedo. Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, being in the last panel is kind of we're all tired, so I'm going to make my answers very brief. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate I, I know I've uh, been in uh, this type of situation before uh, with you guys two years ago. But um, I feel that you know I have the uh, academic, the skills, the experience to serve on the board. Um, I have a, I'm a planner. I'm also a houser 
Yeah, I've always been interested in housing. Uh, in terms of my academic background, I have a master's degree in planning from Harvard and PhD studies from UC Berkeley. Um, I, my experience, I worked for GAO for 25 years as a housing and community development specialist. Now, that experience is good in the, se in the sense that, as you know, GAO is an agency that does oversight and accountability, and I think that's what's needed right now at the planning board. Um, I also have served on the HOC, as you know, for 12 years. Part of that time I served as the chair, um, and uh, we, we had a, a very good board. We never had the drama that the planning board had. We got along, we basically uh, did a lot of uh, work by consensus, the board, and we respected the staff. And I think I would bring that same kind of experience um, if, if you guys selected me for the board. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Presley. Again, thank you for having us. Thank you for considering me once again. So uh, my answer starts with eight years of service on the planning board uh, from 2008 to 2016. Um, and I think what's interesting is I started on one side of the dais, which was civic activist uh, to the extreme. And then serving in the planning board position, I learned quite a bit over eight years. It was an honor to serve with very amenable boards. I mean, I've been under Royce Hansen and then Francoise Carrier and Casey Anderson and gleaned a lot of information and went from being um, very extreme on one side to being able to be balanced enough, as I mentioned in my cover letter, to anger each side equally during that term. Um, in addition to knowing how to go through the things, I understand the operations of the planning board. I had a great admiration for the staff um, and I believe they did for me as well. I think one of the most significant things I could provide, especially in an interim position, is just being able to keep the ball rolling. Um, a lot of people coming before, you know, in the interview have said, keep things going as they have been. Keeping things moving, yes, but there's gonna be room for some improvement. So some of the other things I can bring to that is that I've had roles as operations manager for certain places. I've run two companies, myself, I own my own company right now. And I understand the importance of the transparency factor, um, rebuilding the confidence. I think I have the capability to do that. Um, but most importantly, I think the experience I've had will translate immediately into an operable service. Thank you. Mr. Zients? I'll try to be short. I've been short all my life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is a familiar situation for me. Uh, uh, being on this side of the table is a little bit odd, uh, but I, I thank you for the honor of being a, a finalist in, in this. I think my entire 37 career, year career has prepared me to be on the board. 37 years of that were with the Planning Commission itself. I started as a summer intern under Royce Hansen. Royce Hansen taught me when he was a professor at AU, just to tell you how old I've been. Uh, probably the best thing I ever did was, was get uh, Norman Dreyfus to be on the Aspen Hill Citizen Advisory Board. So you can see uh, I've been around a little bit. Um, I started out as, as a demographer. I went on and, and did uh, comprehensive master plans. I was then in charge of the specialist uh, at Park and Planning. Uh, transportation, historic preservation, natural resources, park planning, uh, uh, and in that, of course, I was a supervisor for Gwen Wright uh, before she went on to Arlington and, and became planning director. Um, after that, of course, I went to uh, the council and helped them with the zoning ordinance and, and did that for 14, almost 15 years. I've, I've been a, most recently a volunteer for the council. I helped with redistricting and reviewed the uh, parks department budget. So I know the planning department from a very different perspective than about everybody I've heard today. 
I know it from the staff position looking up at the planning board. Uh, and then from the council, I know it somewhat looking down at the planning board. Uh, and the perspectives I have not had is, is being an applicant or a participant before the board. Um, but I certainly have learned uh, how to deal with uh, public hearings. Uh, I think you've uh, seen that I have the temperament to deal with uh, contentious hearings and to uh, listen and uh, provide an adequate response to, to people coming before. Uh, in terms of law, I've taught land use planning and, and subdivision law at University of Maryland. I'm still teaching, uh, at, teaching as a, a guest lecturer. Uh, I, I still am a guest lecturer at uh, uh, George Washington School of Law. So I think I have some experience to put me in good stead for being on the, on the board. Thank you very much, Mr. Zients. Ms. Presley, we'll start with you with this next question. How would you help restore confidence in the board and support staff as an interim member? Uh, first and foremost, the staff has to know that they have a safe environment to express any concerns or any ideas they have. Um, when I was on the board before, it was clear that staff were comfortable in their role. Each, each group has their own discipline and they weren't afraid to present, even though sometimes a board would disagree or ask questions. The sense I have now is that people may be pressured to not do what they would otherwise do without feeling pressured. Meaning, I would, I would hope that they could see that they can come to us without fear of reprisal, that there's no one opinion on the board that should drive what the staff do. It's the other way around. They need to be made comfortable again, that they can do what they need. And, and I would extend that even to their own directors that no, no pressure should come to a staff person from an upper level down. They are to prepare and present, and then we weigh it. Um, I think that there should be made an opportunity, perhaps not with the interim board. The interim board should, should maybe consider ways that staff could have a way to report any concerns they have. Um, that's something that, again, I know there's investigations going on, so I wouldn't expect us to tackle that as a board. I would just expect us to reinforce the respect that I think was clear in the years at least that I served and the openness for them to feel free to express what they need to express. Um, I further think that it's important for the board to understand that it's a service and a responsibility. It is not an authority, it's not a power. We're given powers but they're given to do a service for the community. And I think the staff has to see that happening again, knowing that we're all serving together in different capacities. Thank you. Mr. Zients? This is on restoring confidence? Yes. The, the, the first confidence we have to restore is the council's confidence in the board itself. Yes, you'll make the appointments, but we have to earn your confidence by doing the work. And I'd like to say, uh, make the trains run on time, but it's the trains, the planes, the, the cars, the, the buses, it's the bikes, it's all of that. And, and we have to take every individual case and go forward with it. Well, uh, the planning board has legislative responsibility to, to do subdivisions, uh, to do site plans, uh, to advise the council. On the applications, we need to get that going and you need to see that, that, our, that our decisions are, are competently made. And we will do that one plan at a time. It's the only way to earn confidence, is a little bit at a time. With regard to staff, I, I would, with the greatest degree of modesty, I would hope that my appointment would reassure staff that staff is respected there. I'm a known entity there. Um, I, I think I still have a good reputation there. You can test that. I don't know it. But um, I think that will help. 
Certainly, they need to uh, given the space to do their jobs. They are professionals. They should be treated as professionals. They should be respected as, as, as professionals, as everybody up here has said. Um, I, I think uh, if we handle the world one thing at a time, I think that's Jack Palance in City Slicker. The secret to the world is it's just one thing. You just have to do it one at a time. And, and that goes with trust and earning trust. Thank you. Mr. Pinero? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what has been said today. I think the council, you have uh, made the first step in selecting and having a group of people who are very talented. No matter who you choose, I think some of the people here have uh, will be contributing a great deal uh, to um, improving the morale at the planning board and also improving the communication with the council, uh, which is very important, but you've taken the first step. I think um, the way I have been on, the, on different boards is that you, you really have to respect the staff. You have to listen to them. You have to uh, have some empathy and this is kind of an awkward situation where you will be walking in and uh, we have to find a mechanism so that they can communicate any of their concern, have, uh, you have to create certain stability, consistency, so that they don't feel that you know, they're gonna be in any way losing their, their positions, their jobs. Uh, there's not gonna be any upheavals, any changes. I agree with a lot of the what people have said here that as an interim uh, uh, acting board you really have to uh, for the first two or three months not make too many changes um, be careful about the changes that you make but consult with the staff and and be sure that you know you you give them the opportunity for them to, to talk to you and to get to know them i have known the board as a when I worked in, on HOC, we would have quarterly meetings with the, with the board members, and of course the planning director, the ED would be there, but now you have, uh, you have a new board, so uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be very interesting to have those meetings with some of the top staff and, and see what their concerns are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that brings us to our third question. Mr. Science, you'll start with this one. What are the most critical issues you believe the board needs to address other than restoring confidence in the next few months? It needs to get back on schedule. Uh, again, applicants have rights to have their processes, to have their plans processed. Um, there, there is, by virtue of having no board, a moratorium on preliminary plan approvals. Uh, you have to get back to that schedule. There are leftover approvals that the, the prior board approved, but the resolutions haven't been done. You have to do that. We have before the week, the, the uh, planning board has before the council uh, uh, development, uh, the uh, development approval procedures. Uh, I think it just got that this past week. We have to get that through. But, but the biggest thing, of course, in the next three months is the budget. Uh, and having reviewed the budget, you, I would want to go through some uh, factors that came up uh, in that review. I want to see how they're doing on vacancies and, and whether they're get, having the staff there to do their jobs uh, and doing what we could do as the board to help uh, promote that. The budget is probably the biggest thing in the next couple of months. Uh, of course, beyond the applications that come in as applications do, um, there are at least two master plans underway. We can offer what, what guidance we can during that, but again, leaving the major decisions to the permanent board. Thank you. Mr. Pinero? Uh, yes, I think um, 
some of the issues is definitely we have to keep the planning board moving on decisions that need to be made within the next two or three months uh, regarding uh, development applications or master plans, sector plans. Um, I mean, some decisions are going to have to be made. However, I feel that I am coming in with no interest. I don't have any conflicts, any, uh, any I haven't you know, I'm totally neutral, totally objective. I'm not coming in kind of with some prejudices. There's going to be a learning curve on, on my behalf uh, because, you know, I've been working with HOC. I have more of a housing perspective, but I'll be listening and uh, participating in the discussions. But, you know, it's not like, for example, looking at the budget, I don't have any idea what the budget of the of the planning board is, but I am willing to learn. I will sit there and I will try to, like I've done before. I mean, this is something I've learned when I worked at GAO. Many times, you know, we were not, we were not welcome when we would go into an agency or into a program, and we had to learn as much as they did in a short period of time. So I'm willing to learn, and that's why I'm here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Preston. I certainly echo everything that Mr. Zion said uh, from a tactical perspective. There's a lot to be done and some catching up to do, and that, that's a, a given. But I think beyond that, the interim board should really be uh, strategically preparing for the new board in any way possible. Um, I wouldn't know until or if I was appointed interimly uh, if, if certain procedures have changed that might shouldn't have been changed. <laughs> You know, just the standards of how uh, the public are able to present, how, if any of that's changed, I, I wouldn't know until I got in, but paying mind to those things to make sure that a new board coming in doesn't have to deal with a lot of that administration that could happen while we would be in that place. So I think those are the two. Thank you. Um, the next question, Mr. Pinedo, we'll start with you. What, will, sorry, what role should the planning board take in addressing racial equity and social justice issues? How can lessons learned during the council's review of the racial equity and social justice components of Thrive, such as culturally and linguistically proficient outreach and engagement, be incorporated in future planning endeavors? Yeah, I think that the planning board has to play, has to play a very crucial role. Uh, uh, in terms of social justice and equity issues. Uh, I think that in a way they have to, planning is a process and you have to include communities that have not participated in the past. You have to do outreach, you have to find a way of including them. No matter what you do, uh, when I was at the uh, chair of the HOC I would meet quarterly with the residents, we would have town hall meetings, in fact, many times our, me, our board meetings were not at the HOC site. We would have them in different locations, invite different people, and not necessarily to talk about specific issues, but we would listen to them, and they felt that they were participating in the process. Uh, I think that's the most important part. Um, that, uh, I, And again, I, I'd like to see what the planning board has done in terms of um, the metrics, how they're dealing with the social justice issues and equity issues, and, and see whether it's enough or uh, definitely uh, whether it's been a room of for you know that needs to be improved, and uh, that that would be the main thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Preston. When I was on the board, we did start to be very mindful about reaching out to the communities who couldn't. Or either they couldn't attend hearings at the board or they were perhaps intimidated. We included translators. You know, with the Wheaton plan specifically, I think um, the minds were opened about what people feared, which was you're going to change our community and take away the small stores, and as you know, that was able to be preserved. I don't know uh, how they're reaching out now and since COVID, but I really did appreciate the staff going out into the communities with translators, going into the different communities and continuing to do that throughout the, especially the master planning process. So I think that's critical, but also from a development review perspective, that's where 
we could really be of service, not just not the inner board, but I believe it's the board's role to ensure that the development plans, one, one uh, candidate mentioned gentrification. Well, what's going to happen if we put these new things here? Where do these people move? It, that's got to be part of the weighing of the, you know, what's important to, to allow and what has to be put in place, infrastructure and other things to support that. So I don't think a lot of that is going to fall to the interim board, but the interim board can at least determine how the staff is reaching out and set those wheels in motion so that that's a plan to have translators and people on site to hear what people need to be heard on. Thank you. Mr. Zients. I, I certainly agree that, that a master plan and, and a general plan like, like Thrive is a long-term endeavor. Uh, but I also know that, that planning essentially are random steps in a general direction. And each thing you do, you need to consider racial equity. And there are three separate areas, I think, that the planning board uh, has, and, and they're all very different. One is regulatory, where the applicant comes in, and that is the action in front of you. Nobody. In, in the private, in the public side, uh, prompts that ac action except through incentives that the that the council might provide. Uh, but so you need to be inclusive for what comes in the door. A and of course, there are outreach plans that the that the um, uh, planning staff has to come up with uh, all the time. Uh, but for regulatory, uh, it, it's got to be a routine measure. It's got, you got to think about it. Uh, for master plans, uh, that's where the, the, the board would have more oversight on exactly what that outreach plan would, would be. And, and hopefully it would be inclusive. The real um, piece of of the public pie that, that the planning board has is for the parks department uh, because they, they actually operate in geography. They have individual parks, they, they buy land, they a little bit operate programs, mostly the rec recreation department operates the programs. But, but that's where the consideration of rec uh, racial equity needs to be most pronounced. Uh, and uh, it, it's something that, that they are aware of, that, and they are measuring parks by uh, how accessible they are to uh, all demographics in the county, including racial minorities. Uh, so they have gone some lengths to it. Uh, just one step at a time will get you to the general direction. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, last two questions are fairly straightforward, but um, um, do you have interest in serving as chair? Uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Pinheiro. Uh I don't have any interest in serving as chair. Thank you. No. Thank you. I have the interest, um, I have the time. The, the only thing I have on my calendar is going to spring training. And there I should say, uh, if I get offered a contract, I'm staying. <laughs> so um, just be aware of that. But, but look, I want to serve. This is an agency that I admire, that I have the greatest respect for, and that I want to help. And however the council thinks I can help, I am happy to do it. Thank you so much, Mr. Zions. Um, and then the final question is, are there any potential conflicts, or conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Mr. Pinero. Uh, none for me. The, the only thing that the council should be aware is that I am serving on the Board of Appeals now as a member. So I would have to resign that. And there's only four members right now, which creates a problem if um, there's a vacancy because they need four members to vote on some, some of the issues. Gotcha. So you should know that. Thank you. Ms. President. No, I have no conflicts. Um, but if it's appropriate, if the president will allow, I have an add-on comment to the last question. Um, in case I don't get appointed, it should be something for consideration. We put the master plans in place 
but we don't follow up as mm -hmm. a board. They're, they don't continue to be brought before us to track. Did that park ever get delivered to the community mm -hmm. it was promised to? So I wanted to get that on the record. So whichever board is in place, it should be something that's looked at to, to keep a calendar, to find out was it delivered on time, if it wasn't delivered, why, and when will it be delivered? But no conflicts. Thank you. Conflicts, I own one piece of property in the city of Rockville with my wife. That, that is it for a property. I have no business. My family has no businesses in the county. Um, uh, I, I have some stocks of which I have no control. <laughs> uh, but uh, that should be no conflicts. I do receive a check, and, and I didn't put this on my state form because they didn't ask it in a way that I understood it. Uh, I do receive a check from the uh, employees retirement system of Park and Plant. And now that's a closed retirement system. It has not been a conflict with any other prior employee who, who served on the board. Uh, the retirement system has dealt with this issue before, but I wanted you to be aware of it. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. Thank you to all of our panelists today. We've got a tough decision to make, which is a good thing. <laughs> Um, because the, the, there are some really extraordinary, extraordinary candidates, and again, all those that have applied as well. I just want to reiterate three things. Uh, one, these are for the temporary positions, um, that if the temporary members would like to apply for the full terms, they are have the ability to do so, but being on a temporary position does not give them a leg up. Uh, it will be the next council that will determine um, who this next body will be. This is just a bridge. Uh, to get us through this challenging time. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, colleagues, uh, two, two more items on the agenda before uh, going into closed section. Uh, the next item then is an action uh, amendments to the 2022-2031 10 year comprehensive water supply and sewage systems plan deferred category change request uh, TransQuest LLC, Travilla Oak LLC, Aurora, Kapoor, and Anine. Um, Mr. Levchenko, I'll turn it over to you to um, walk us through this packet. Sure. I'm, I'm joined today by staff from DEP. We're here to answer questions if the council has any. Um, we do have six requests before us uh, as part of the two actions before you. They're shown as separate actions because they're separate resolutions, uh, but we can discuss them uh, basically together since they're all category change requests that are uh, uh, the first five are deferred that are coming back and the, the sixth one is a current request uh, that the council has not acted on yet. And just logistically Mr. Levchenko do, Levchenko, do we need to vote on each of the six individually or can we vote um, on them as a group? The, the first five are part of one resolution so those could be done uh, as a group. Okay. Uh, the sixth one, uh, the Mohebi request should be done separately since that's a separate resolution. Okay, got it. Thank you. And um, uh, this, uh, the first five that I mentioned as deferred requests uh, are uh, linked to the actions the council took today on the 10-year water and sewer plan. Uh, they were deferred uh, pending consideration of some policy issues in the 10-year plan uh, that if they were to uh, affect these requests, then the request would come back. And that's, in fact, uh, what's happening here. Um, so as I go through these, I will be referencing the 10-year uh, water and sewer plan, uh, which the council approved earlier today. And, and uh, I, there's also some linkage between these projects, and I'll, I'll mention that as well. Uh, the first two projects, the TransQuest LLC and Travilla Oak LLC requests, um, uh, they're related because they're, they're actually adjacent to each other. They're both located on Travilla Road at the intersection with Glen Road in Potomac. Uh, both requests are seeking a uh, sewer extension in order to allow for the commercial redevelopment of those properties. Uh, the TransQuest request is currently uh, a, uh, a single-family home property dating back to the 19th century, uh, known commonly as the Old White House. Uh, the other property, the Travilla Oak property, is currently a shopping center. Uh, the uh, uh, applicant with the single-family home is looking to uh, convert the property uh, to a uh, country inn restaurant, and then the uh, Travilla Oak request is seeking to redevelop the shopping center to add some additional 
um, uh, facilities at the center, um, and we can get into more details if you have regarding both of those. Uh, they both would require dedicated uh, 5,300 foot low pressure sewer extensions, uh, which would need to be approved by WSSC Water. Uh, and so that, that's a separate process in terms of um, getting that approval through them. Uh, and those are long extensions, low pressure sewers, so there are issues they would have to deal with regarding that. Um, neither request had a policy in the current 10 year water and sewer plan uh, that would allow the council to approve them. Uh, that's why they were deferred pending consideration of policies that could allow such, a, such approval in the, in the um, recently approved 10 year plan. Uh, in fact, in the 10 year plan, the council did approve a commercial sewer service policy. Uh, the committee discussed this at length. Uh, and under those conditions of the policy, both of these requests uh, appear to be consistent with that and would be um, eligible for service, assuming they meet those criteria. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the t and &E committee recommendation for both of these requests is essentially a conditional approval. Uh, it would first require that the 10-year plan itself be approved by the Maryland Department of the Environment, which is the next step in that process. Uh, it would then uh, require those properties uh, requests uh, to, to um, be consistent with the 10-year plan policy uh, that's recently adopted by the council. Uh, if, those, if those conditions are in fact met, uh, then the, uh, these, these, appro these conditional approvals could be granted uh, without having to come back to the council. Uh, so those are the first two requests. If there's any questions, we can get uh, deeper into them, but I, I'll stop there in case there's questions. I don't see any questions from colleagues. You can continue, Mr. Lovchenko. All right, the uh, next two requests uh, that are linked to each other are the Aurora request and the Kapoor request. Um, uh, these are properties located across the street from each other on Boswell Lane in Potomac. Um, they both have single family homes on their properties. The Aurora request abuts a current main and is, uh, has already been approved for um, a uh, connection to the existing main. However, the uh, applicant had also requested a main extension as part of that approval. Uh, to allow for a more direct connection to their property. Uh, that main extension would also then abut the Kapoor property uh, and would allow the, corp the Kapoor property uh, to connect as well. Uh, so last year the council approved the, uh, main, the uh, connection for the Aurora property from the existing main but deferred the main extension issue. Uh, for once again, similar reason that you heard before, uh, the, there's no policy in the plan that that uh, speaks to allowing for main extensions under the current abutting mains policy in the plan. Uh, so the council deferred that request and the Kapoor request uh, pending consideration of that policy. Uh, and in the 10 year plan, the committee recommended and the council approved today additional language for the abutting mains policy that would allow main extensions under certain circumstances. Uh, and under those conditions, uh, the Aurora and Kapoor requests uh, would, be a, would be eligible for approval. Once again, they'd be conditioned for similar conditions you heard earlier on MDE approval of the 10-year plan and also that these, the applicants meet the conditions of that language in the policy. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there and see if there's any questions regarding those two requests. Nope, don't see any. All right, the last of the deferred requests is the inane request. Uh, this is a uh, two and a half acre RE2 zoned outlot uh, located on the west side of Piney Meeting House Road um, in the Potomac subregion master plan area. Uh, the applicant is seeking public sewer to build a house on the outlot. Uh, the request was deferred last year because uh, there's the, uh, once again we're talking about the abutting mains policy which um, is the applicable policy um, in this case. Um, a neighboring property that was part of the subdivision with the outlot received the abutting mains rights uh, a number of years ago uh, during that subdivision process. So the outlot itself does not have a right to connect to the abutting main. However, uh, the applicant for this uh, request owns a contiguous property uh, next to the outlot uh, which does have abutting mains rights. 
Uh, and under certain circumstances, those two properties, the outlaw and the contiguous property owned by the same applicant, could go through a resubdivision process uh, that would allow effectively for the transfer of those rights from uh, one, one piece of that subdivision to the other. Um, however, rather than requiring that cumbersome, expensive, lengthy process, um, uh, staff worked with uh, the committee and with uh, DEP staff on a uh, policy that would allow for the transfer of abutting mains rights under certain circumstances. And uh, the committee came to agreement on that and recommended approval of that policy. Uh, and the council supported that as part of its 10-year plan action today. So there's now new language in the plan uh, that allows for the transfer of abutting main rights under certain circumstances. Uh, and under that, uh, this outlot would be eligible uh, if the applicant chooses to pursue that following those limited requirements. Uh, once again, it would be a conditional approval based on MDE approval of that new language in the plan uh, and the applicant uh, following the, the required uh, uh, or the requirements of that uh, of those conditions. Uh, so with that, I'll stop there just to see if there's any questions regarding that request. Don't see any requests for questions or comments. All right, the last item uh, is the Mohebi request. Uh, this request came to the council earlier this year. Uh, I went to public hearing in July. So this is not a deferred request. It's coming to the council for the first time. Uh, it involves a 5.17-acre RE2 zone property uh, located um, uh, on Centurion Way near Macrossan Lane and Trevilla Road in Potomac. So once again, in the Potomac subregion master plan area. Uh, the applicant has an existing home on the property and is seeking uh, public sewer service to serve that existing home. Um, and the committee had a lot of discussion about this particular request. It is an unusual case for a number of reasons. Uh, first, it's a very unusually shaped property. It's got a, a northern piece and then a pipe stem and a southern piece. The home is located on the northern piece of the property. The sand mound septic system that currently serves the property is on the southern portion of that property. Uh, so that's unusual and it's also a, quite a long distance between that sand mound system and, and the, the property in the house. The house is also located uh, adjacent to the planned sewer service area uh, in, uh, in Potomac. Uh, but because it's adjacent to the Palatine low pressure sewer system, the master plan has explicit language uh, prohibiting approval of uh, connections to it under the peripheral sewer service policy which the council has dealt with in the past where there are um, cases where properties can connect if they uh, abut or confront the planned sewer envelope. Uh, so that particular policy was looked at uh, by the committee and, and uh, there is some uh, further review being done by DEP and WSSC Water to see whether that restriction is still needed. Um, uh, it, was, it was done originally in the master plan because of capacity concerns and WSSC Water would still have capacity concerns that we'd want to make sure are addressed. Uh, so that, that piece of this issue uh, is something that will come back to the council at another day. Uh, but in the process of this application, the applicant also mentioned that he was having significant issues with his septic system and having to do a number of equipment replacements that were expensive. Uh, it's not a very old system. It's only about five years old, so this is unusual. And as I mentioned, it's an unusually shaped property as well, which is creating challenges for the system as well. And based on the, um, the applicant's concerns and, and the uh, uh, costs he's incurred to date, uh, the committee was uh, comfortable recommending approval of this request uh, based on the public health concerns of the, uh, of the current uh, condition of the septic system. Now I will say that the DEP staff and DPS staff are uh, trying to work with the applicant to see if there could be a viable on-site solution. Uh, however, at this point, uh, we don't have information that there is or there isn't. Uh, however, in the meantime, the, the committee was comfortable recommending approval um, to the degree we find out information later that uh, the applicant finds there's a better on-site solution. Uh, we can certainly pivot that way. Uh, but the applicant was, in, was interested and, and knows that they would have to uh, pay the cost for the sewer extension and all the on-site costs associated with that as well and expressed uh, uh, interest in connecting to the system and the committee was 
comfortable with that at this time. And I'm, uh, that's the last of the six requests. So that, that request is also, uh, 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 if it goes forward, we need to go to the Maryland Department of the Environment for approval um, under the public health concern um, uh, justification. Uh, but unlike the other requests, it doesn't rely on the 10-year plan approval that I mentioned earlier since it's not, it's not seeking a new policy in the plan. Thank you, Mr. Lovchenko. And this is all regarding item number 11, is that correct? Yeah, that was the second okay. uh, piece, the second item on the agenda of, okay. of the Fair. water and sewer right. category changes. So that is 11 and 12. So um, I don't see any other questions or comments from colleagues. Oh, Councilmember Rice looks like he is formulating one. Mm -hmm. I just had a quick question. Again, being I think I'm the only council member who's actually on, uh, <laughs> well, one septic uh, or, or um, uh, for a septic system because I'm mm -hmm. in Darnstown. So I'm just curious because I know our conventional systems are much easier, uh, for the most part, less expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious on the northern part of the property, is there no place where it could? be installed to assist with that? And was that looked at? Because that wasn't mm -hmm. re referred to, so I just, I'm just curious. Well, you are correct. The, the system currently being used is a sand mound system. Now, that, that isn't a loud system, uh, but it's not a conventional system like, like it sounds like you have. Uh, so there are some additional challenges you can have with that. Uh, and the, the geography of this property is definitely a challenge as well. I, I'm not familiar with the, the process that led to this particular <coughs> subdivision. Uh, but it's it's a very unusual barbell shaped property, and so the the home is taking up uh, the land that it needs to take up on the northern piece, mm -hmm. and the southern piece is where the septic <coughs> system was able to work. Thank you very much, Mr. Lovchenko. Appreciate it. Councilmember Hucker. Yeah, Kelly. It's a, it's 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 an unusual. I mean, we've brought we the committee's brought you dozens of these over the years. This is an unusual one in that it's an unusual property. It, like all of ours, has been you know, approved by the county and WSSC, but there are <coughs> conservation limitations on development of the other part of the property. And the situation <coughs> is bad enough that you know, not only has he had sewage backing up into his house several times, the contractor installed an alarm to alert them when they should stop in the middle of a shower <coughs> or stop washing clothes um, because it's about to back <coughs> up again. So we thought this makes sense. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Running out of gas here. Um, all right, so can I get a motion to accept the first five deferred category change requests as recommended? Moved by Councilmember Hucker, seconded by Councilmember Jawando. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hands. That is unanimous. And the second is can I get a, um, can you articulate the second motion so I make sure I got it right, Mr. Lipchenko? Well, it would be approval of the. <coughs> um, uh, uh, WSCCR 21 TRV 03A David Mohebi uh, requesting uh, S3, which is um, its approval for public sewer that is not immediately available. It does require an extension. And then the conditions are noted in the attachment to the resolution for uh, one sewer connection only as a public health concern. Uh, and it also recommends the, uh, the alignment for the sewer. There's a, there's a, uh, WCC Water identified a couple different ways to serve the property. Uh, the recommendation uh, by the committee and as noted in the resolution was for the shorter connection, the 70 foot connection to the southern portion of the property. I'm glad I phoned a friend Sorry. on that one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mr. Levchenko. Can I get a motion to accept? Um, okay. Uh, moved by Council Vice President Glass, seconded by Council Member Friedson. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. And Mr. Levchenko, I, I want to, um, our silence in terms of questions is because we have supreme confidence in the incredible work that you and your colleagues have done, uh, which we know has been exhaustive. And this is a big deal to each of the residents who are benefiting from this change. So we really appreciate your leadership. All Thank right, you. colleagues, uh, I now need a motion to go into closed session to consult with council to obtain legal advice pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article 3305B1I. Topic is appointment of planning board members. Moved by Council Vice President Glass, seconded by Council Member Friesen. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I need to reread this. Um, Proposed closed session to discuss appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Articles 3305 
B1I. Topic is appointment of planning board members. Can I get a motion to go moved by Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Fritz, and all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. All right. All right, we are adjourned. Mill Road, Maryland 115, and Emory Lane.